October 26, 2021. Could we please stand for a invocation by Ms. Pickett? All right. I want to start by recognizing that this is the last Board of Ed meeting for this standing board. We have a very important election on November 2nd, and I hope everybody comes out to vote. This is called the invocation or the moment of silence. So I'm going to offer some questions for us to reflect on before we start our meeting. I've always loved the notion from Anise Nin that we do not see things as they are, we see things as we are. As such, I believe understanding how we, Board of Ed members and field public school leaders and guests show up to this space is important. We all have our own unique life experiences, values and beliefs. <clears throat> this is a topic worthy of our reflection because we are leaders charged with making vital and important decisions. Our understanding of ourselves and reality must be scrutinized. If we're not careful, we may fail to realize how our sense of self, how our identities affect the decisions we make and the people that we serve. So before we begin, let us personally reflect quietly in our head on things on these questions. Who am I when I enter this space? Who do I represent? How do my life experiences, values and beliefs impact my decisions? And how do I hold myself accountable to the outcomes of our Enfield Public School students? Thank you. Amen. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Thank you, Ms. Pickett. Fire evacuation, in an orderly fashion, if something was to happen, it would, the two, we have two exits out of the chamber, one to the rear, out to the parking lot, and one to my left, your right, out these doors, first left down the rear, uh, down the stairs to the rear parking lot. Can we have roll call, please? Mrs. Pickett? Here. Mr. Ryder? Here. Mrs. Thurston? Here. Mr. Ungeyer? Here. Mrs. Acree? Here. Mrs. Cushman? Here. Mr. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Chairman Cruzel? Here. Thank you all for being present. Uh, number six, board guests, we have none. Number seven, superintendent's report, Mr. Dresick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in honor of Ms. Thurston's last business meeting, I will make this as quick as possible. Um, just really quickly, I'd like to send out a special thank you. I normally would say thank you to our teachers and staff, but some, most of them are here, so thank you. Um, but I actually have to do a special thank you to our nursing supervisor and our COVID coordinator, uh, Nurse Jess, as she's affectionately known, but Jess Spera, um, who also took on the role of being COVID coordinator selfishly, so I didn't have to any longer. I know she had a rough couple of days, uh, especially over the weekend. Um, we unfortunately had more um, quarantine cases this weekend than we've had you know, up to, the, to any point this year. So I know that the, her and her team and the nurses at every school and our principals are working tirelessly for contact tracing and things along those lines. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I gave Ms. Uh, Nurse Jess the, the credit that she doesn't want but right, rightfully deserves. Um, and just to get, make the board aware, um, this is, I don't know anything more than um, what I'm about to share, but just to keep on your radar, there is conversations happening at the state level with regards to the quarantine procedures. So as you know right now, if you're a direct contact, you get quarantined for 10 days. Um, there are conversations happening about possibly adjusting that. That's as far as I know. I do know it's happening because we had a, we got called to a meeting at four o'clock on the Sunday afternoon to talk about it. So. Um, so I know these conversations are taking place. I'm not sure what the end result is going to be, if any. You know, the quarantining procedures are in place right now still stand, but there is some talk that possibly making adjustments to it down the road. So in the event you hear something about that on the news, I wanted to be able to tell you first. Um, you'll probably find out what they are quicker than I have a chance to tell you. Um, same thing with I, I am getting a lot of questions about student vaccines. Um, I think the FDA voted to approve student, uh, kid, children from age 5 to 11, 5 to 11 age group. If they haven't done it today, they were going to. Um, but that looks like it's imminent within the next week that students would be able. What I did find out is there are 277,000 Connecticut children in that age group. So that's 
leading the reason I'm mentioning this tonight is I have gotten questions saying you know, when th that age group of students are eligible, will we be doing school-based health clinics again? In all likelihood, no. no. Um, Although this morning on one of our calls, the state did ask if we would do school-based health clinics, but it wouldn't look like it looked like last spring when we had a mass vaccination site at, at, at the Annex. Um, because again, you're only talking about a population of 277,000 kids total for this age group at this point. Um, and I know that one of the things we had heard is that they were gonna try to administer that through pediatricians. I don't know if that's actually accurate at this point or not, because it hasn't been approved, but we're expecting news you know, in the coming week about um, the number of children who would be eligible for vaccines if parents choose to go down that route. That no one in any of my conversations has said anything about it being mandatory for school as children, just like it's not now for 12 to the 12 and above that are eligible. Um, there has been no discussion about any kind of mandated vaccine at this point. Um, but I have gotten questions from people saying, are you going to have clinics in the event that it's possible that we would partner with the health department to do that? But at this point, that's basically all the information we have. But I wanted the last thing to bring to your attention is, and I brought this up, and there was a little confusion um, about the state requ requesting that we opt into the, te the weekly testing program for those who are unvaccinated or interested. Um, and I know some parents had reached out to me saying, I don't want my kid tested. And the message didn't come out that, that it was voluntary. Um, it wasn't something that something you had to opt into. You couldn't opt out because you didn't opt in yet. Um, hopefully we squared that away. Um, and the reason I wanted to start with Nurse Jess and end with Nurse Jess is because Nurse Jess is actually single-handedly running our testing program, which is gonna be up and running soon. Um, and actually it's more well attended or more parents volunteering than I had originally thought. We have over 600 families who are uh, opting into the voluntary weekly testing program. And all of that is being administered through Nurse Jess. So for those families out there that are, are partaking in this, um, don't be shy about reaching out to Nurse Jess or being patient with her as we get this up and running. But you know, also don't be shy about sending a thank you to her because that was a pretty large undertaking for 600 families. So thank you again to Nurse Jess. Um, all Enfield Public School students will not attend school on Election Day, Tuesday, November 2nd, as well as all APS schools and administrative offices will be closed in observance of Veterans Day on Thursday, November 11th. All Enfield Public Schools K-12 through students will be dismissed early on Tuesday, November 9th and Wednesday, November 10th for either K-12 conferences or half-day staff PD. And lastly, the Board of Education will hold an annual organizational meeting on Tuesday, November 16th here in Council Chambers per your board policy 9321.2, annual organization meeting of the board. That's enclosed in your packet. Uh, Town Clerk Sheila Bailey will administer the oath of office for newly elected 2021-23 Board of Education members. And we will also recognize the 2019-2021 outgoing board members at that meeting, which means Ms. Thurston, you're not done yet. That concludes the superintendent's report. And did you want to add that tomorrow also is an early release day? I'm sorry. Yes, tomorrow is an early release day as well. <laughs> okay, sir. So we're going to start with audiences. And seeing the room is full, I'm just going to ask that we please keep the background noise to to nothing, not even a minimum. I don't, I, we, I don't want it. I want to hear what people have to say up here. So any comments, please keep it to yourself and let the person speak. So, let me get my timer set up here. So we're gonna start with, and you're gonna help me with the yes, names. Absolutely. Evangeline Flaherty. Evangeline Flaherty. Sorry about that. Name and address for the record. Evangeline Flaherty, 78 Jackson Road. I am here to advocate critical thought in our community. I began coming to these board meetings because my daughter came home with assignments that triggered me to question the curriculum. Tonight I turn my focus to the pink slip sent home with our students. It states, as part of our sixth grade health program, your son or daughter will be participating in the following two units in topics described below. A, family life and human sexuality. B, HIV and AIDS. The form states, if we do not receive a completed form back from you, we will assume you are providing consent for family life and human sexuality instruction. As a parent who has seen some questionable assignments, I wonder what we discussed during this 45-day quarter. I think we can all agree transparency on these topics should be the number one priority. Enfield has stated it does not support CRT, yet assignments we have seen contradict that statement. Because of this, it seems only fair to question what assignments may slip by in sex ed as well. 
Given sexual identity has already been approached in classes such as English and social studies without my permission, I fail to see the purpose of this form as it would appear to have no effect on teachings in other classes. The Connecticut State Department of Education website recommends that districts provide an ongoing opportunity for parents to review curricular materials prior to classroom instruction in family life education as well as sexual health education. Given that statement, I request full disclosure on what assignments and discussions will take place in this 45-day unit in order to make an informed decision on whether to allow her to participate or not. I encourage the board to consider the likelihood of tangible harm to students' bodily privacy, safety, and dignity in private spaces by discussing such deeply personal topics in the classroom. CRT, DEI, SEL, whatever three letters you want to put in front of this curriculum does not matter. The content is the same. This curriculum takes aim at our children's innocence, and that I do not support. Ensuring an appropriate curriculum for all students remains the goal, yet I admit with a looming vaccine mandate and the continuation of mass, I am nearing my end with this school system. And I am not the only one. I hope the schools understand the amount of parents prepared to withdraw their children from the public school system if the vaccine becomes mandated, and take into account the financial impact that will have on Enfield. Many parents are actively seeking escape from this community and Connecticut, including myself. As prices increase and school board policies continue to shake us, it seems there's no other choice. I encourage anyone listening to question the events taking place around you and use common sense. Inflation, food shortages, vaccines, and masks, how can you not see what's right in front of you? I know far too many people who prefer to shield their mind's eye from the truth. They live in a perpetual state of denial, hoping their problems will cease to exist if they pretend they are not there. However, shutting out your problems does not dismiss them. Ignorance is bliss. On the contrary, it creates an opportunity for those problems to grow. Thank you. Giselle Moore. Good evening. Giselle Moore, 10 Rifle Drive. I'm here because I want to advocate for critical thought in our community. This is the last BOE meeting before the election and parents have been coming here to voice our concerns on various issues from masks to curriculum to vaccines to funding. From the first meeting, Mrs. LeBlanc offered to research how we could find creative ways to make masks optional and get back to us. I appreciate this very much. You always listen to us and offer feedback instead of ignoring us. Since this last meeting, could you share any information you have found? Mr. LeBlanc stated certainly discriminatory teachings were not here, but we found out here, but we found out they are. Has anyone on the board looked further into TED as a replacement for DEI or the PREP Act to find out mass guidelines? We need to get back to the American ideals of equality and liberty, not the anti-America ideals of equity and collective guilt. How do we get feedback from you? Do you view it as part of our duty to respond to the public that elected you when they ask questions? At the very first meeting I attended, Mr. Ryder tossed aside a paper while stating the mass thing it isn't on the agenda, as if tossing aside the concerns of the parents. As a parent and a community member, this was very hurtful. I want to ask the board members to open their minds and hearts tonight as you listen to the parents as they ex express their concerns with dignity and respect. We are here because we are extremely worried about the future of our children. Schools are the bedrock of our community. We are here asking you to fight with us. God says, love thy neighbor. Under the guise of love, we are slowly being taught to view liberty and freedom as selfish. But this is a paradox. Anything that destroys liberty and freedom cannot be loving by definition. Mandates are inherently destructive of our liberty, no matter who they come from. Discrimination is inherently opposed to loving thy neighbor, no matter what the grievance. There are forces attempting to tear our community apart. It is untrue that you must teach children how they are different in order to teach them how they are similar. But if people believe what makes them different is primary, they will be unable to un unite on what makes them similar. You have sat in this chair. We're all the same, no different. Yes, we're all unique, but we're all endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. 
We must come together, hold this to be true. When we disagree, it's when our foundational principles are needed the most. Either we find them now and come together as one, or each sink alone. Parents are sitting in this chair just as you have before and have been disappointed when they get no response. This is a flashpoint in history I don't think anyone could deny it after the last two years. Our actions now will determine our future. Don't throw our concerns out like a piece of paper. I'm going to have to stop you right there. Really please. quickly. You are on the side of dais at this point. Listen, think critically about this issue, opens your heart, and please respond. Thank you. Colleen O'Callaghan. Come on, John. Okay. Colleen O'Callaghan, 10 Midway Street. Last time I spoke, I talked on several different topics, but tonight I really wanted to focus on the COVID vaccine, as obviously the FDA just approved the emergency use authorization for five to 11 or 12 years old. Since the last time that I taught, uh, the statistics have gotten even higher. Um, there are now, instead of a little over 700,000 VAERS reports, there's over 800,000 VAERS reports. In the UK, there are over 2 million, and Israel, um, it's more than that. I sent you guys all, uh, except for one didn't have an email, but I sent you guys all an email with a short video clip from um, a man named Steve Kirsch. He is the executive director of COVID-19 Early Treatment Fund, and he gives, um, there's just a little blurb about what he talks about, and he shows, obviously, slides and stuff. I can't do that. And I really would like you all to look at that. We need action. We can't just have talking because while this should be a choice and I understand that, I don't think people are getting the real information. And this is coming off the CDC website. It's not like I'm making it up. People need to be aware of the dangers that these vaccines are causing to adults and to young adults. And what is gonna happen when parents think, oh, this is approved. It's only approved under the emergency use. That doesn't mean it's been approved by the FDA, and the FDA does not do their own testing of anything, not medicines, not supplements, nothing. That would be exorbitantly expensive. They rely on the companies, and these companies have lied. I mean, they've gone through lawsuits about other things. People need to understand that these vaccines can cause harm. You need to make your own decisions, but at least check the data out. VAERS is extremely important, and not everything gets reported on there, so the numbers are actually much greater. Nobody wants to harm their child. They just want to protect their child. And I would just like to talk a little bit about what Steve Kirsch said. In a nutshell, he said that um, four times as many heart attacks in the treatment group in the Pfizer six-month trial report, but VAERS shows that heart attacks happen 71 times more often following these vaccines compared to any other vaccine. I really hope people do check into this because nobody wants to find out the hard way what can happen. Children are the least affected. Thank you. Matt Schmidt. Name and address for the record. Matt Schmidt, 1304 Bigelow Commons. Good evening, Board of Education members. I am here tonight to advocate for advancing critical thought. On April 18th, 2020, the FDA, which regulates masks as medical devices, gave emergency use authorization to mask as a method of source control for COVID. Masks are still under this emergency use authorization, or EUA, and are not FDA approved for use by the general public. According to federal law, there are specific requirements that must be met for a product under an EUA. 
such as recipients of products must be informed of the significant known and potential benefits and risks associated with the emergency use of the product and of the extent to which such benefits and risks are unknown. Recipients are also to be informed that they have the option to accept or refuse the EUA product and have any consequences of refusing administration of the product. In essence, a consent form. The FDA further recommends a fact sheet be provided to recipients that includes necessary information about the product. Well, I asked around, no Enfield school parent I talked to ever received any fact sheet or consent form relating to masks. So I looked on the Enfield Public Schools website and my search turned up nothing there as well. The only consent form I could find was for iPads. That was part of a 12-page technology handbook. Now I understand the importance and value of the iPad, and I don't argue it warrants a detailed handbook, but the iPad garners a dozen pages of documentation while an FDA-regulated medical device mandated for all students gets nothing. What does it say then about the value Enfield Schools puts on its students if it cannot even be bothered with providing consent forms and fact sheets to parents about a medical device as required by the FDA? This board has stated how they must dutifully follow the law, yet here you are, both parties, flouting federal statutes. Maybe you are unaware of the law. Maybe now that you are, I urge you to send out consent forms as soon as possible to parents that include a fact sheet about masks. Not only will it put this board and the succeeding administration in compliance with FDA regulations, it will also allow the parents of this district to express their consent, either way, to masking their children at school. And though it should go without saying, I want to make note here that consent forms and fact sheets are not a partisan issue. Because honestly, who here would argue against giving parents more information and at the very least the semblance of a voice? Don't you think the subject deserves at least as much consideration as an iPad? I want to end by addressing the board on a more personal level. I hope you don't just discount what I continually present here because you don't agree with my conclusions. That kind of hard stance suppresses meaningful discussion. Meaningful discussion that could lead to mutually agreeable resolutions. Though I'm opposed to the school mask mandate, it does not mean I'm opposed to any member of this community or any member of this board. I don't see enemies in this room. I see people that give a damn about kids. I just believe we can and should work together here in Enfield to find a better solution for the children under our care. And deep down, I hope you do as well. Thank you. Frank Rummery. Ramore. Ramore. Sorry about that. You're pretty close. Name and address for the record. Frank Rummery, 93 Candlewood Drive. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about uh, policy. I've been watching these meetings for quite a while now, and there's been quite a lot of back and forth <clears throat> with the, between curriculum and policy, and it's been established that the superintendent and his staff create the curriculum and the board controls the policy. So, all right, I'll buy that. Oh, given the arguments, I'll buy that. So I went into the policies to look at what they are. And I came across the first one was the mission statement. And the very first bullet of that mission statement, create a safe, nurturing, academically challenging environment. Okay. Well, I think you got the academically challenging environment, probably. I, I, don't, I haven't seen the books, but I'll go with that. But safe and nurturing, I'm not so sure. There was recently an assault, all right, in Loudoun County, Virginia. A predator got into a girl's bathroom and assaulted him, uh, insulted, insult, assaulted her repeatedly and in a horrific way. The way, what facilitated him coming into that bathroom was a Board of Education policy. And so I, I said, wow. How could that happen? And is that in Enfield? So I looked at Enfield's policy, and the same policy exists here. Almost word for word, I would say. In fact, it's my opinion that they were probably cut and pasted from the same source. This put that child in danger, and it, it's putting the children of Enfield in danger, too. You have to look at this policy. In fact, I'm going to summarize by saying it was a woke policy. We've got a woke war going on in this world, in this country. It's a war of ideas. The woke think 
they have their own ideas, and the people that aren't woke have another. The woke are trying to create this utopia, I see. They think they can re-engineer society into something really terrific. And people that get in the way and don't go along with it, well, they're pretty much marginalized and steamrolled. Well, what's happened is it's come from the university, it's gone through the media, it's in politics, but now it's down into the public schools. This policy that I'm talking about in yours is, is a woke policy. And I think it's dangerous. I think what the woke crowd has decided that in order to get ahead, they have to put the children in, into this war. They're indoctrinating them at a very young age. So by the time they're graduated from high school, they are completely on board with the woke thing and society will be transformed and we'll be in utopia. This is what I see going on. Now, what kind of a war would you put your kids on the front line? But that's what you're doing. This girl in Loudoun County paid the price. This could happen in Enfield, too. It's the same policy. I'm going to have to stop you right there, sir. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Emily Hulovich. I think I got it right. You did. Thank you. Name and address for the record. Sure. Emily Holovich, Three Cutter Lane. Um, I just would like to speak to you a little bit tonight about why teachers and teaching is so important to me. I believe in Enfield Public Schools. I grew up in town and attended Parkman, JFK, and Enfield High. I chose to make my home here, and I believe in everyone sitting in this room so much that my own children are in Enfield Public Schools as well. How lucky am I to give back to the district that inspired me? Now, I get to teach in Enfield and hopefully inspire a new generation. Each day, I get to see and hear the amazing things teachers are doing every single day. It is inspiring to walk down the halls and witness my colleagues teach. Most of you know by now that I am the Enfield Teachers Association president. Taking on this second job wasn't a decision I made lightly. Just as expected, it's been extremely challenging at times. Chris, Andy, and I don't always see eye to eye. However, what we always agree on is what is in the best interest of our students. I have found working together has never benefited anyone better than our children. As a district, as an association, and as leaders of our children, for our children, I hope that we can continue to compromise. The staff of Enfield Public Schools is incredibly grateful for the leadership that was demonstrated during the most challenging of times this past year and a half. Chris communicated with the staff and families regularly and always kept our health and safety as the top priority. He thanked the staff often for their hard work and dedication and they felt appreciated for their efforts. All of Central Office even really tried to take good care of the teacher's mental health through such difficult time. The staff appreciates the personal nature of this leadership. Chris knows everyone's names, what they teach, and even writes handwritten thank you notes. In addition, Chris and Andy are approachable and understand the importance of collaboration concerning problem solving. When we have the support of our board and administration, we can better support our students. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry Winnis? Winans. Winans. Sorry. It's all good. That's what it looks like. Is this thing on? Okay, good. Hi. Um, my name is Sherry Winans, and I live at 1227 Enfield Street. I'm a proud, lifelong resident of Enfield who has come full circle because now I have a son who is a senior at Enfield High School. And now I sit here before you, having just started my 31st year teaching in Enfield. Normally, I know you think I look really young and that's impossible, but <laughs> normally I would be sitting at home watching this meeting, but not tonight. I really felt the need to come and speak. So I have this friend who teaches in a different district in Connecticut. And when I shared all the happenings in Enfield, she said to me, that's funny. I couldn't even tell you what political affiliations my board of, member, board of Ed members have. And that spoke volumes to me. So what I'm here to do is to get us on the same page by sharing many positives that are happening at my school, Prudence Crandall, where I teach fifth grade. 
with the hopes that this helps to bring all of us back together as to why we got involved in the world of education. Did you know that students are excited to be back in school and they're coming to class eager to learn? Especially after the year we had last year. Celebrations are happening at the end of our reading and writing units. Our fifth graders have jobs around the school that teach them responsibility and pride. Students have book clubs to discuss themes and character traits. There are hands-on learning opportunities like creating a story arc using post-it notes and string. And there's real science experiments going on. We have students learning to be flexible and have empathy when another student might be having a hard moment. The STEAM program is allowing the opportunity for students to go through the engineering design process and scientific inquiry process. Fifth graders across the district participated in the Connecticut Kid Governor process. They pick a platform that's near and dear to their hearts and they write speeches that promotes their wants and they compete against all the fifth graders in the town. And yes, we had the winner. Go Chloe Clark. <laughs> we also have morning meetings every day that help students to connect with each other and practice mindfulness and self-awareness. And I'm sorry to my teachers, I know it's three minutes. If I miss one of your things, I'm sorry. So please know that this is only a partial list of the great things that go on at my school. So you can only imagine what goes on, all of the positive happenings in all of our Enfield schools. So look, I don't have wanted to be a teacher since first grade. Being a teacher is a calling. And as I stated before, I've been in Enfield a long time. And we have a group of hardworking, highly educated, loving teachers who are here for the kids and the families of Enfield. We might not be perfect, but the large number of teachers behind me, the 40 or so, and the ones watching at home are always working on bettering themselves and going above and beyond the expectations of this job. Because of the support of our leaders, we've been able to take care of our families and the families of our students during the pandemic. So thank you to my leadership, Amy Dennis and Russell Sills. Mr. Longy, thank you very much. And especially to you, Mr. Dresick, for supporting us, me, our colleagues, and allowing us to be the teachers that our students and families expect. Thank you. Jessica Soule. Name and address for the record. My name is Jessica Soule. I live at 10 Brook Road. I am a fourth grade teacher at Prudence Crandall School, and I've been teaching in Enfield for six years. This town is my home. I live in the same district where I teach. This town has been part of my family for many years. Both of my parents graduated from high schools in Enfield. My parents remained in town after their marriage and I was born as a resident of Enfield. Enfield has always been an important part of my life growing up. My husband and I bought a home in the summer of 2020 at the height of the pandemic. We specifically looked for a home in Enfield. I wanted to return to my hometown. Finding a home in the same district as my school was a bonus for me, as I genuinely enjoy seeing the families of current and former students on my street and in my neighborhood. This current school year marked my 20th year of teaching. The past several years have been some of the most unique, but also some of the most inspiring. I have watched and guided my students through social distancing, mask wearing, missed games, competitions, and missed recitals, but I've also watched them cheer and encourage their classmates working through a tough division problem, creating stronger writing pieces, or simply adjusting the rules of recess to be more COVID safe. I have worked side by side with some of the strongest and most dedicated teachers I've ever worked with in my career. When schools first closed in March 2020, my grade level colleagues and I would spend a lot of time on FaceTime discussing how to continue the meaningful connections that we have made with our students, how to help our students and their families, and how to keep them on track for fifth grade. The 2020-2021 school year was challenging, but I always felt that Mr. Dresick and Mr. Longy had the best interest of our students and teachers in mind. When we asked for more time to plan for and more time to work with our fully remote students, they helped us by allowing remote Wednesdays. On those days, I had an opportunity to connect and meet with students and their families in a way that has never existed before. 
My students last year, now fifth graders, proved the power of high teacher expectations. I conceded to them at the beginning of the year that learning conditions were going to be different and more challenging. However, I held them to the same expectations that I hold all of my students to. In the words of our principal, Mr. Russell Sills, I expect nothing less than their personal best. Enfield teachers, especially my colleagues at Crandall, have given their personal best this school year. Our students are very excited to be back in the classroom full time five days a week. We are eager to work in small, socially distant groups, leave the classroom for our specials, and be able to play together at recess. I always feel comfortable and confident approaching my administrators as I know that they continue to support me as a teacher. Since March 2020, I've reached out to Mr. Dresick and Mr. Longy to express my thanks for supporting me as a teacher in their district. Tonight, I want to thank the board members who have continued to listen to teachers and done the very best they could to help our students be successful. In the words of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. My students are exampling that that change is happening for the better in Enfield, one child at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Wilcox. Good evening. Michelle Wilcox, 5 Cheryl Drive. I have lived in Enfield all of my life, and I have taught in Enfield for 30 years. In that time, I have worked under a few superintendents and several boards of education. I can honestly say that Chris Dresick and Andy Longy's leadership has positively impacted education and our community in ways that many people sitting on this board, people tuning in, and people sitting behind me may not know. Because of the generosity of the Enfield Public Schools, under the direction of Chris Dresick and the math department, specifically Diana Labeck, Dr. Carrie Wiley, and Jay LaMesa, materials that no longer serve the students of Enfield were used to support a math engagement program at Lunch Bunch. Students who came to the lunch program would have an opportunity to explore mathematics through games, cards, puzzles, building blocks, cubes, fraction stacks, and countless other manipulatives that were passed along. Teachers also donated games from their homes to support this special day of learning, which happened every Tuesday in the summer in the basement of St. Raymond's Church on Pearl Street. Simply stated, Chris Dresick cares about our community. Our community includes families, parents, grandparents, teachers, school staff members, bus drivers, board members, political leaders, but most importantly, students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy Guzzi. Amy Guzzi, 165 Weymouth Road, Apartment 4. Hey, good evening, board and guests. I am Amy Guzzi, like I stated before, and I'm a third grade teacher at Parkman Elementary. I also, like many other speakers tonight, am an alumni of the Enfield Public Schools. As a student in Enfield, not that long ago, I had great teachers who I still remember to this day, and hopefully the students that I've taught will also look back and think the same thing one day. But tonight, I'm here for the purpose of saying thanks. Thanks to those board members who support the teachers, and thanks to Mr. Dresick and Mr. Longy and the staff at Central Office for their support as well. No one gets into teaching for the fame or the fortune. And you actually don't get into teaching, teaching kind of gets into you. A lot of teachers are born or grow up from a very young age knowing that they're going to be a teacher. And while, yes, we have chosen this job, it's nice to feel valued by the superintendent, central office staff, and some members of the Board of Ed. I've worked for a few different superintendents in my 20 years working in Enfield, and I can say without hesitation that Mr. Dresick is by far and away the best. 
He's always thinking about what's best for kids. And as I say that in my voice, I'm hearing his voice say it at many board meetings in my head right now. Doing so, he knows that doing what's best for the kids, he needs to support the teachers who are teaching those kids. He values our experience as professionals and knows how hard we all work. We have received countless supportive, thoughtful emails from him. Besides his unwavering support of the school staff, Mr. Dresick also loves coming into schools and interacting with the kids, seeing firsthand what they are doing. This coming Thursday, the 28th, the third grade at Parkman School will be having our annual Mini-Me Pumpkin Contest. It is back and going to be better than ever. All central office staff and Board of Ed members should have received invitations in their email or through Teams. I know Mr. Dresick and Mr. Longy will be there to enjoy the students' work as they always are. In fact, in 2019, they both came on a Wednesday to vote for the pumpkins and then came back the following day for our school assembly when we announced the winners. Because as Chris said, we had to see who won. <laughs> During their many school visits, Chris and Andy have told us about many times that coming to the schools to see what the students have been working on is the best part of their jobs and I would have to agree with them. I'd also like to take this time to thank the Board of Ed members who speak up and stand up for us teachers and value our hard work. It's usually the same few board members and your support of us hasn't gone unnoticed. We appreciate you giving up your free time to work on this board and to back up the teachers as we strive to make a difference in Enfield with every child every day. That's all I have for tonight. Just some well-deserved thanks for some very deserving people. Hopefully I'll see the board members in a few days on Thursday. Please come between 9.15 and 3 o'clock to vote for our pumpkins. And in the words of my favorite robocaller, as always, thank you for your time and have a pleasant <laughs> evening. Thank you very much. Ryan Schutz, did I get it right? No? No, correct me, please. Ryan Schutz, 106 Church Street. I am here because I want to be an advocate for advancing critical thought in our community. Last time I spoke about freedoms and unity. Since then I have witnessed more division and totalitarianism from our great politicians. Mr. Arnone said at last meeting for us all to hear, our children will continue to wear masks until they get this genetic experiment. I call it a genetic experiment because that's exactly what it is. They now call it a vaccine due to the fact that it's being injected in people. Trust the science, they say. This is great response for a person who doesn't apply any form of critical thinking it's whatever they're told then regurgitated just do as you're told and never question anything which is not science what about the scientists and doctors that are being silenced or discredited or anyone that speaks out against their agenda the pharmaceutical company stated the genetic experiment had 95 percent efficiency which was very misleading to say the least a peer review on vaccine efficiency and effectiveness done by the lancet confirms the 95 percent efficiency was referring to relative risk reduction not the absolute risk reduction. They use the relative risk reduction, which is the ratio of attack rates with and without a vaccine. Relative risk reduction considers only participants who could benefit from the vaccine. The absolute risk reduction, which is the difference between attack rates with and without a vaccine, considers the whole population. Absolute risk reductions tend to be ignored because they give a much less impressive effect size than relative risk reduction. To name a few, the high being Moderna and J&J, 1.2%, Pfizer, 0.8%, meaning after receiving the vaccine, you are 99% just as likely to get COVID. So how does, this get, how does getting this genetic experiment help other people and why would you be required to get? What about natural immunity? If it doesn't stop spread, why would I need a passport? As our state continues to decline in the name of COVID, is it plausible that the governor's crew continue to profit from this pandemic? Pandemic. We definitely know his wife and him are, so why would they ever want to end it? Vax the world, but can't feed the starving. Any form of critical thinking applied will find anyone advocating these requests are either uninformed, irrational, or has ulterior motives. If I am against masking my child, then why would I ever be in favor of signing her up for an agenic, genetic experiment? Let's not forget the FDA approved OxyContins as non-addictive. This is a super reach from our government to further indoctrinate this trust science mentality. 
and further take our freedoms is not just us unmasked, unvaxxed parents that are being robbed of our freedoms. It's all of ours. Doesn't matter which way you vote, we need to band together and end this before it's too late. We sit here and bring forth all these statistics and studies to the board. We parents are doing our deep research. How many of you are? Next time before your condition response, trust the science. Why don't you go and take a look and see if you truly trust too. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Marquez. Amanda Marquez, 8 Hoover Lane. I'm here tonight to continue advocating for critical thinking in our community. Our Constitution and civil rights have been written so concrete and ironclad as to not allow an overreaching government to encroach on our liberties. Our own Board of Education also has a set of policies that govern and protect the liberties and freedoms of our students. The Enfield Board of Education declares in policy number 5132 that appropriate dress is essential in order to create and maintain the best environment for the students of Enfield Public Schools. This environment must allow students to learn and teachers to teach without distraction or disruption to the learning learning environment, as well as be indicative of the dignity, pride, and respect our students have for our school, community, and themselves. It also states restrictions on freedom of dress shall be applied whenever the mode of dress in question constitutes a safety or health hazard for the student or those around the student. In addition, restrictions on freedom of dress and adornment may not reflect discrimination as to civil rights or enforce particular codes of morality or religious tenets. A child stating they cannot breathe constitutes as a safety and a health hazard. Elevated levels of 14,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide after three minutes in a max constitutes a safety and health hazard. A face mask contaminated with pneumonia, tuberculosis, diphtheria, E. coli, Legionnaire's disease, and multiple meningitis strains constitutes a safety and health hazard. Children claiming irritability, headaches, difficulty concentrating, and depression constitutes a safety and a health hazard. Yet once again, our very school board is so willing to look the other way and break their own policy because as one board member stated last meeting, I don't see it as a loss of liberty if medical professionals are guiding us. Nazi Germany Nuremberg trial defendants claimed they were just following direction from a high authority. So does that not make their crimes against humanity wrong? If a higher authority, say a medical professional, mandates us to do something against our free will, then that is not a loss of liberty. Nuremberg Code Point 1 states that the voluntary consent of a human subject is essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to consent and should be so situated as to be able to exercise the power of choice. The very definition of liberty is the power to choose. Give up the right to choose what experimental medical interventions are applicable to your body and you have a complete loss of liberty. Recent data from the CDC and Public Health England both state that despite being unvaccinated, children still remain far safer than their vaccinated adult counterparts. A lie doesn't become truth wrong doesn't become right and evil doesn't become good just because it is accepted by the majority. We must stand up for our rights and for the rights of our children. It says so right in your board policy number 6120. Children must develop the skill, knowledge, and values necessary for responsible citizenship and develop an understanding of the obligation and privileges in citizenship of our democracy. They must develop patriotism and loyalty to the ideas and ideals of democracy in America. Why even include that in your policy if you yourselves won't stand for the very ideals? When will our board of education start critically thinking, analyzing the overwhelming data against the use of masks in children, follow their own policy, and stand with the parents for the safety of the children. For masks, there's a simple solution, and one that doesn't mean tossing out our own individual civil liberties, and it goes like this. Those who choose to wear masks can do so, and those who don't are not mandated against their free will. Thank you. Patrick Flaherty. Make sure, make sure that mic's on. Patrick Flaherty, 78 Jackson Road. I'm here tonight to advocate for critical, th for critical thought. We have been forced to watch America and the free world spin into an exorable decline due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We, along with countless others, have been victimized, gaslit by propaganda, psychological trickery. By now, it should be obvious to all, but, I, but it doesn't seem to be. These operations are being conducted by an unelected, unaccountable elite against the American people and our allies. Now, please don't roll your eyes and shrug me off. Don't just... Dis don't just dismiss and heckle. 
think critically. Stop and take a look around. If you're watching this now on your phone or your tablet, I'm urging you sincerely. Ple I'm pleading with you. Sit down and allow yourself to see things for what they really are. Don't just get angry because you might uh, hear something you don't like or because it's a different opinion than yours. <clears throat> Excuse me. And never let politics of any kind get in the way of ju your judgment making. Think critically, think for yourself, shut out everything, give yourself the atmosphere you need to do so. Maybe choose to not watch your favorite TV show or your favorite book or whatever you do in your own downtime. I'm begging you at this point, please look into it. Across the board, everything, you're, everything being mentioned tonight, what's the worst that can happen? You entertain the perspective of another person's opinion for a night? Our children's mental and physical health have been suffered immensely over the course of the past year and a half. They have felt the sting of isolation, lockdown, masking, quarantines, and other completely unsensible acts of healthcare theater that have done absolutely nothing to protect the health and well-being of the public from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. With that being said, being part of the school board doesn't mean you're there to defend the schools. It doesn't mean you're there to defend any politician and or their agendas. Being part of the school board doesn't mean you're there to defend your job either. Like we all witnessed last time, I think we can all agree we saw a lot of finger pointing that night. And not one single question answered. Defending the kids, that is the job description. It should be the only action of the person appointed that job. The kids come first, not the school or the federal money that comes under the strict condition that kids are masked. It should be that, it should, it should be that simple. I'm calling you to act, do something. Maybe a quick Google search, look up how much power does the governor have. Under a Google search, it'll say the governor heads the government's executive branch in each state and territory, and depending on the individual jurisdiction, may have considerable control over the government budgeting. Uh, budgeting, uh, budgeting excuse me. The power of appointment of many officials, including many judges, in a considerable role in legislation. Now consider this. That's just the everyday normal power in that a person in that position has. For those unaware or not paying attention, Governor Lamont is now on his sixth extension of executive powers, giving him 100% control. So when you have our schools collecting federal funds, federal funds that can only be obtained if they comply keeping everybody's kids in a mask all day, breathing in their own carbon dioxide, minimizing the amount of oxygen the next breath is allowed to take in. It just doesn't make sense. They know there's not a living, uh, there, there's not a living, breathing, functioning, coherent, rational, thinking human being who actually believes that masking kids is a good idea. But they well and are willing to do that with your kids in mind. Why, personally, I think it's for the money. Again, I'm you. here to advocate for critical thought. So for now on, I will. For, so for now, I respectfully leave you with this. Maybe a direction pointing. Uh, excuse me. It may be a direction worth pointing your moral compass in. Apply some critical thought. Start small, go to Google, type in pandemic profits, link to Connecticut's first couple. Just See what you, you find. Stop Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Ryan Moore. Ryan Moore, 10 Rightfield Drive. I'm here because I want to be an advocate for advancing critical thought in our community. I want to revisit some comments from the last meeting because I think they're very important to understanding what is happening, not only in our community, but they're reflective of what's happening across our country. Last week, a member of the board made the statement, I don't think it's a loss of liberty if we're being directed by medical professionals. And I argued to the board that this is an appalling statement for a public official to make. I appreciate in particular Mrs. LeBlanc's approach to her service. You take notes, you pay attention when we speak, and you actually take time to address our concerns, whether or not you agree with us. Mrs. LeBlanc addressed my comment, but in doing so defended against an argument that wasn't made and a response to a comment that wasn't made. She defended saying she trusts and believes doctors. I did not argue that it's appalling for her to believe doctors, though, because that wasn't her statement. I support fully you having the liberty to make decisions for yourself and your family. I wish you would fully support mine. What I find shocking is the willingness to say publicly that there's no loss of liberty if it comes at the hands of medical professionals. That is not only a refusal to acknowledge history, but an endorsement of technocracy and a rejection of our constitutional republic, intentional or not. Benjamin Franklin said, those who would trade essential liberty for perceived temporary safety deserve neither. Mr. Ryder asked me several times, why are you even here after the last meeting? Maybe this was simply rhetorical or meant to be derisive. It's possible that transparency, community civic engagement, and accountability were not the principles that guide this question. 
Or maybe it was sincere, despite our continuous and specifically stated goals. Regardless, either scenario is indicative of the times that are upon us. A publicly elected official asking a member of the public that elected him at a public meeting, why are you even here? We have residents stalking other residents who have different opinions. We are not well as a society. If we haven't lost it already, we are losing all respect for civic process, a constrained government, equality under the law, and liberty for all. We are asking you to help us. We are asking you to start thinking critically, to be an example to our children, ask more questions, find answers, think outside the box. Help us find a way to end the destruction of our liberties. John Locke explained that when a government becomes so oppressive and tyrannical that there are no longer remains any legal remedy for citizens, they have an appeal to heaven and may resist tyrannical government through disobedience or other means. This is what undergirded the American Revolution. This by necessity would not be easy. It would take courage, leadership, unity, and critical thinking. If a document of specific written questions from parents doesn't tell you why we're here, let me state it more broadly now. I am here to advocate for liberty. I am here to advocate for the truth of God. I am here to advocate for my children. And I am here to advocate for your children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Jackson. Sherry Jackson, 119 Cottage Road, Enfield, Connecticut. Most people are slowly coming to the realization that something isn't right in healthcare today, especially if you venture off the path of mainstream media. Most of the media you consume is owned by one of six companies. Please fact check this. Many doctors and medical professionals know what is going on, but they have been threatened with reprisal and have been censored and discredited when their findings contradict the per prescribed narrative. Some are still somehow getting their message out even though they face extreme loss for themselves and for their families. Doctors such as Simone Gold, Peter McCullough, Eric Naputi, Robert Malone, who is one of the creators of the mRNA technology, and many, many others. They have stated over and over again that we have been gambling with the world. Their concerns about these primary experimental vaccines have been minimized by government agencies. There is an urgent need for open scientific dialogue on vaccine safety in the context of large-scale immunization. There is also a need for a risk-benefit analysis database so that people are well aware of the risks of these vaccines compared to the benefits that they deliver, especially when it comes to our children. Children are, and young adults are the least likely to suffer from COVID-19 and the most likely to experience myocarditis as a result of the vaccine. This is a lack of scientific justification for subject, there is a lack of scientific justification for subjecting healthy children to experimental vaccines, given that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that they have a 99.997 survival rate if infected with SARS-CoV-2. Not only is COVID-19 irrelevant as a threat to this age group, but there is also no reliable evidence to support vaccine efficacy or effectiveness in this population or to rule out harmful side effects of these experimental vaccines. Side effects such as low platelets, non-infectious myocarditis, heart inflammation, especially for those under 30, deep vein thrombosis, and death. Some adverse reactions, including blood clotting disorders, have already been reported in healthy and young unvaccinated people. There are also a number of peer-reviewed studies that show natural immunity is effective against reinfection of the disease and its variants. According to the CT, CT data, which tracks COVID-19 case, cases among staff in public and private schools, there were 78 cases cases of COVID-19 in Connecticut schools last week. 55 were vaccinated, 21 were unvaccinated, and two had an unknown vaccine status. Are the unvaccinated the biggest problem when it comes to the number of cases? What if the vaccinated were forced to be tested as I was, and as I am told that they can present as asymptomatic? Either test everyone or no one. These are unfair labor practices and are crippling our schools and many other agencies. No human being should be forced to take this vaccine. If you would like to take it, take it. But it's especially wrong to force this vaccine on those who have recovered from the virus or are too young to have 
have a say, be informed, or even be at risk. Please do not gamble with our children. This is of paramount importance. I'm just going to add one more thing. Teachers, you're amazing in this town. The administration is amazing, and the board is amazing. And I've really been impressed as a former teacher just watching all of you. So I want to applaud everyone here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dina St. George. Dina St. George, 25 Misty Meadow Lane. Good evening. Thanks for listening. I am here because I love our children, our community, and our country. I am here because I want our children and our community to embrace critical thinking. We see all the mandates that are happening all around us. We live in the Constitution state. Do we really know what our Constitution means? And more importantly, do we really understand our constitutional rights? Whether you believe that COVID mandates are the right thing to do or not, the situation goes far beyond health. Americans have fought for freedom for over 200 years. We go around the world spreading ideas of freedom and democracy. But when you get, begin to compile mandate after mandate and loss of freedom after freedom, it becomes very significant. Once we lose the freedom to evaluate and choose risk for ourselves, we lose the liberties at the foundation of our nation. As each thing is taken away, we become desensitized. It begins to change our idea of a new and acceptable normal. Soon we will not remember what it was like to have the freedom we once did. Our children and our grandchildren will experience less freedom and they won't have the privilege or pleasure to enjoy the same choices our parents had or that we have. If we give any of these mandates and we don't stand up for our freedom of choice, we dishonor every military service person who has served or is serving for us. It's a disservice to the people who fought and bled for the very freedom we enjoy. Whether you believe in the mandates or not, we need to stand up for everyone's freedom of choice. You may support the mandates because they fall in line with your current beliefs. But if we let this happen now, there will be a day when you're told to do something that does not fall in line with your beliefs. If we don't stand together and fight back in one voice soon, we could be told where to live, what job to do, what religion to believe, how many children you can have, do you really want someone telling your children or your grandchildren what, when, and how they will live every minute of their lives? It's time we take a stance. It's time we strongly advocate for our freedom of choice and the future of this country while we still can. Thank you. Thank you. Joshua Humry. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Joshua Hamry, 52 New King Street. The last time I was here, I spoke to this board and explained that I was not here to talk to you, that I was here to talk to the people that are watching, particularly the children, to the ones that don't have the opportunity to come to speak to you for whatever reason, for the comforts, for their safeties, for the bedtimes, whatever the reason might be, to speak to you about the ones that are marginalized. And I've got a couple of different correspondence that I would like to read to you before the end of the night, if a public comment section allows for the second one. I'm gonna start with the first one though. I have not read this yet. This is the first time I'm reading it, so bear with me. Good evening. I'm emailing in regards of a discussion that took place two meetings ago that really caught my attention. I wanted to address how I feel about the situation, yet I cannot attend due to my schedule. The discussion was about whether or not gender identity should be taught in schools. A lot of people are against this, I noticed, although I would like to explain why it should be taught in schools. Edited for the name to keep him, his privacy intact. I'm a young transgender male. I'm a freshman at Enfield High. I always knew something was different about me growing up, but I never knew what. I had a strong disconnection with my sense of self and my body at a young age. It was and still is a very real thing. I have been forced to live with this every day of my life. Despite knowing my identity now, it took me a long time to figure out what it was. Nobody ever taught me anything. My parents probably didn't feel the need to, and it was never brought up in school. Why was this topic so shied away from, all, after, from, shied away from all these years? 
You're never too young to learn about this. When I started to realize who I was, thanks to the internet, I, I wanted to come out at school. This was, in, this was in sixth grade at JFK. I was teased to the point where I became suicidal at only 11 years old. And the administration did absolutely nothing about the students who tormented me. Is this what you want for the youth of Enfield? Also, did you know that suicide rates increase up to 40% for transgender youth? We have to protect and look out for them. I hope you take this into consideration. Teaching these topics earlier on in schools will not only help students find their identity, but will, it will also educate them and mature them so that when a fellow classmate does decide to come out, there are no issues. I would also like to request that this email is spoken about at your next meeting. Thank you, and I hope all is well. I read that to you tonight because the gentleman, uh, the student that wrote that emailed each of you that exact same letter. And he was concerned that he hadn't received a response from over half of the board. So he asked me to read it in public so that people out there know that they're not alone, as was my message the last time. They're not alone. I appreciate your time this evening, and I look forward to speaking to you again before the end of the night. Thank you. Sue Braun. Uh, I came to speak tonight on something totally name, name different. An name an address for uh, the record. Sue Braun, 17 Light Street. Thank you. And I, I sat back here and listened to everybody and thought, geez, you know, maybe I could educate a few people. 23 years ago, I moved to Enfield, fought for the school system. Uh, at a certain point, I decided it wasn't working for me. So I decided to continue with the community of Enfield. I love Enfield. It's great. But I took my two younger kids out of the school system. I felt that they would be served better elsewhere. And they were, in my mind. My middle child is in Nebraska, full scholarship for academics. He passed all of the IB tests that were given last year, every single one of them. He did awesome. He's in an, he was in a high school. He's now in a college. He was in a high school that was over 70% African-American. My youngest son is in that same high school succeeding as well. This was a choice because we disagreed with what was happening in the school system. This is a choice that everybody in this audience can make. If you don't like something and you've argued it, and there's nothing the board can do about it, look around for an alternative. You can make those choices. I also, for the first time ever, wrote a thank you note to a superintendent that I do not have a child under. Because his insightfulness during COVID was incredible. And I literally, took several of your superintendent messages and sent them to my superintendent, who would reply to me, yeah, I listen to him every week. <laughs> so, <laughs> honestly, it's great teachers, it's a great school system, it didn't fit for my kids. I took them out. That's the end of the lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer Briette. Briette. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Briette, 83 Park Ave. 
I am here this evening to talk about masks. Let me preface by saying I am not a doctor or a researcher. I don't have access to anything other than Google and other search engines. My expertise is in accounting, and I won't pretend I know more than the epidemiologist or infectious disease doctors. I began my research trying to find peer-reviewed studies proving that mask wearing was harmful to children. I was able to find one letter published in the Journal of American Medical Association Pediatrics that claimed mask wearing was dangerous. It claimed that mask wearing increased carbon dioxide, possibly to dangerous levels in children. The problem is the study had critical methodological I'm sorry, flaws. A retraction was published a mere 16 days later. The same authors of this paper recently published another claiming vaccines killed two people for every three deaths prevented. And obviously this is not the case and does, not, does little to boost their credibility. We know masks work to slow or prevent the spread of COVID-19. One just needs to look at the rates of transmission in areas of the country with no mask mandates. A report from Arizona shows that schools without a mask mandate were three and a half times more likely to have a COVID-19 outbreak than those that required universal masking from day one. Average pediatric cases were lower in counties with a mask requirement, 16.32 per 100,000 a day, versus no mask requirement, 34.85 per 100,000 a day. I would now like to read part of the Enfield Board of Education mission statement. We believe public education is essential component of a free and democratic society. In a partnership of family, school, community, and local and state government, our mission is to enable all students to meet high standards, make productive choices in their personal lives, contribute to a diverse global society, and act as responsible citizens. To accomplish this, we must seek the necessary resources to, and this first point is very important, provide a safe, nurturing, and academically challenging learning environment. In order to provide a safe environment for all students, masks must be worn by all until such time as all school age children can receive a vaccine. In order to provide an academically challenging learning environment, we must do all we can to keep our children in schools. Masks and vaccines are two tools in this endeavor. A poll conducted found that 64 re 64% of respondents support government mask mandates in all places, and 69% support mandates for mask wearing in schools. We cannot allow the vocal minority to strip the protections provided by wearing a simple mask. Connecticut has been found to be the safest state during COVID-19, in part to Governor Lamont's mask mandate. This is not an area in which we get to agree to disagree. This isn't some doctor I saw on YouTube that the government is trying to silence. This is silence. I wholeheartedly support Governor Lamont's continued executive powers to require masks in our schools because I do not trust some board members of this board to protect our children. The right to swing your fist stops at another person's nose, and as such, your right to live maskless, maskless in public stops when you are endangering others' lives by facilitating the spread of a communicable disease. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Peter Junaitis. Peter Junaitis. Peter Junaitis, Three Farmstead Circle. I know you people always like to thank people, so I'd like to thank a few people myself who spoke at the October 12th meeting, Board of Ed meeting. Barbara, Matt, Yvette, Ivan Jot, I can't say, that's her. <laughs> the two Maureens, Amanda, Sheila, Colleen, Dana, Connor, Deanna, Nick, Giselle, Joe, and Ryan. Your topics, your words, your passion were inspiring. The mentoring program was brought up at the last meeting. The idea of the mentoring program is good. The implement implementation of the, mentor the mentoring program is poor. 
You shouldn't be coming into a school and pulling kids out of classes for 45 to 60 minutes, especially in an English class, a science class, a math class, a history class, or a reading class. For these are the classes that these kids can ill afford to miss. Do it after school, do it in the evening, or become a big brother or big sister. The issue of doctors was brought up at the last meeting. You go to your doctor because you like them and you trust them. That's your choice. Someone else goes to another doctor because they like them and trust them. That's their choice. To imply or say anything negative about anyone else's choice to believe what their doctor has told them, well, I find that appalling. A couple board members insinuated that it is not the board's job to go over every assignment and ditto that the kids get. That's true. But I don't think any board member here or any parent was implying that. However, if something is very controversial and it comes up, it's the parents and the board's right to bring it up. I will take the opportunity now to also chastise the five members on the Republican Party sitting on this board. I know three of you are new and have been appointed. One is still learning and one is retiring. But you should have sat down with the teachers. They work for you. They are under your supervision. They are under Chris's supervision. And most of them probably wouldn't vote for you anyway, but you should have sat down. But if you keep, but you have to keep the lines of communication open. Don't play politics. At the last board meeting, you had Representative Arnone come up and speak. I like Tom, I believe what he stands for, or I believe that he stands for his convictions. I don't always agree with him, and I'll publicly say I voted for him. That said, I found it very disingenuous to praise him for his appearance before the board and implying otherwise that Carol Hall and, and John Kissel were not here. Carol was in Greece. John and Carol thought they should present themselves together. Tom and Carol actually spoke together. Tom felt he would rather appear by himself and not have a back and forth debate between John and Carol. I guess they all could have been at this meeting. And finally, I implore the next Board of Ed meeting, one of the first things you should do is adopt the same procedures that the town council has for three minutes, plus a second speaking. This three minutes is ludicrous. Do we have another sheet? Anyone else want to speak? I only ask is after you speak, you sign up. Do we have a sheet out there to, for them to sign up? After you speak, please go and sign, uh, put your name and address down for the record. Go ahead. Connor St. George, 63 Fairview Ave. I'm here because I want to advocate for advancing critical thought in our community. There was a recent study, which was brought up in this meeting, by the CDC that made a lot of big headlines concerning mask mandates. Advocates of universally masking children have used this study as a definitive reason for doing so. I think analyzing the study and the response to it can be used as a very important example of the critical thinking, or lack thereof, we are currently seeing. The study purports to demonstrate a few key findings. The most decisive being that schools without mask mandates were three point times more likely to have COVID outbreaks compared to schools with mask mandates. This is indeed an important and bold finding. But before we jump on board and decide masks are in fact an effective measure to stopping a virus, let's examine the science. Some may say we shouldn't or can't do this because we are not scientists, but I argue we can and they can too. Let me show you how. The first thing to understand is that this is an observational study, not, not a randomized control trial. Observational studies are used to primarily to identify risk factors and prognostic indicators and in situations where randomized control tri trials would be impossible or unethical. They are understood to be unproductive in providing determinative evidence as they have no control and it is notoriously difficult to remove researcher bias. But let's look at this observational study in detail. There's no actual numbers provided on cases or number of kids in school. When numbers are missing, it tells you something. The key number here should be numbers of cases per child. They chose outbreaks instead, which is cause for questioning. 52% of mass schools were small, versus 13% of unmasked is important. Fewer kids in schools equals outbreaks less likely. 
The study also provides no context of community spread in relation to schools with outbreaks. If we search ourselves, we can find that cases rates are 2.4 times higher in the no mass areas of greater population density. Stunningly, the CDC basically sets its close contact rules for schools to prove mass work. In situations where both kids are masked, a mass contact doesn't count as a contact and thus doesn't need to be tested. If you don't test for cases, you can't and won't find cases. All this neglects the obvious fact that, again, kids are not a high risk for this disease. So why would the CDC use such an obviously flawed study in which could be described as junk science only if you're being too kind? Why would the media uh, pr propagate these findings unquestionably with headlines like this? Breaking, the CDC releases a bombshell new study finding that schools with mask mandates are three point times less likely to face deathly COVID-19 outbreaks than schools without them. Why would, why would they ignore the Danish RCT study, which had much stronger findings based on rigorous methodologies? We are left with these questions, and let me be clear. Uh, clear. They aren't rhetorical. I look forward to any answers you may have. After all, you have done your own research, and together, maybe we can make sense of this. Sir, sir, can you please, sir, can you please put your name and address down on the sheet? Can you go up and put your name and address down on a sheet? Anyone else want to speak? Uh, it's only one time only. Go ahead, sir. Good evening. Maureen Snook, 33 Buchanan Road. So my mother was diagnosed with stage four large B cell lymphoma in May. Every part of her body that had lymph nodes contained cancer as well as a broken pelvis due to a tumor. When going over different treatment options, we've researched everything. We asked hundreds of questions. We challenged every doctor as we got second and third opinions from doctors at Mass General, Dana-Farber, and we even reached out to a stem cell specialist at NYU. Once my mother was informed and understood all different forms of treatment, side effects, how she was going to feel, which each treatment entailed, she was the one who was able to choose which treatment would be best for her. She had the freedom to decide her medical treatment for combating cancer, which thank God she did because if we listened to her orthopedic surgeon, she would have had a metal rod put in her femur, which wasn't necessary, and would have prolonged her chemo, chemo treatment, as well as made her at even higher risk with a surgery that extensive. My point is, a doctor didn't say to her that she only had one option for treatment, and if she didn't use this form of chemo, then the patient next to her, their chemo wasn't going to work. This is absolutely about standing up for our freedoms, as we can see they are being ripped away. I'm not an anti-vaxxer, as people like to put labels on others, but this vaccine was rushed, and I have seen too many people with negative side effects that I personally would like more time and research before I go and inject it into my child's body. Let's not forget they also took away our religious exemptions this past June. Coincidence? Just two weeks ago, we were told by one of our state reps that once the 5 to 11 age group is approved, depending on how many kids get the shot, they will be able to take their mask off come February. Otherwise, they'll have to continue to wear them. Now we're concerned about mental health of our kids and bullying and equality, yet we're now going to segregate and divide them into two groups, masked, unmasked, vaxxed, unvaxxed. No amount of curriculum change will be able to stop the level of bullying we're going to see in our schools. If you think if you think it's not, just go to any open forum on social media and see how the adults are treating each other. They're shiny examples. And lastly, if you really don't believe our freedoms are being taken away, just think back four months ago when we were all being rewarded with free cheeseburgers and shots of alcohol to get this vaccine, and now people are losing their jobs and the ability to provide for their families and be contributing members of society. If you can't see that, then unfortunately this virus is the least of our problem in this community and nation. Stand up for our freedom of choice, unmask our kids, and stop taking our rights away. Anyone else? That hasn't spoken. That has not spoken, and well, it's, it's only one time only, so. One time only? One time only. <laughs> if it was the town council, we would have been done 20 minutes ago, just to let you know. They only, they only allow an hour. Hi, Christina Tetro, 42 Green Manor Road. I have not yet read this. This is um, given to me from someone else who is no longer allowed to speak. But I'm sure I believe in it. I've glanced over it. 
Week after week, I watch and listen to parents come in front of the board and accuse the members of not being brave, of not being critical thinkers when it comes to the best interest of their children, being told that they are just doing what they are told and not thinking for themselves when it comes to masking our children. The board members sit and listen to what these parents are saying, quietly talk, taking in the criticism and accusations and considering the information they are being presented with. I also watch and listen during board member comments when multiple members have plainly stated that they support the masking mandates because they believe in what the CDC is telling us. It is not that they are giving up their right to be critical thinkers. It is not that they have not done their research. It is that they are not themselves doctors or healthcare professionals. They do not have years of training in the medical field. They have not been working in the labs day after day for the last two years trying to find a viable option to protect our children under the age of 12. They are business professionals, parents, coaches. They do not have the background or the education to be able to make medical decisions. Much like many others, they rely on the experts to provide them with the facts and data so they can make educated decisions when it comes to the students of Enfield. The governor has a job to do and part of that job is listening to those medical professionals that have been put in place to keep the residents of Connecticut safe. He has a very tough job, a job that many of us would never want to do. He has made difficult decisions on a daily basis. Granted, many of these decisions will not be popular with everyone. Many decisions will be questioned and challenged. I cannot accept the fact that he made a decision to extend the executive order without exhausting all data and facts that he had been presented with. I will not accept the fact that this decision was made on a whim or that it was, wasn't a thought out plan. This board has a job to do as well. And while we know that change doesn't happen overnight, I do believe that many of the board members do have the best interest of the children of Enfield at the forefront of their thinking. I also think that they are intelligent enough to rely on the experts to continue making informed decisions. I absolutely expect them to rely on the experts and the scientific data that has been presented to us for the last two years. I would hope that they won't take things into their own hands and ignore the findings of the medical professionals. Our superintendent also has a job to do. His job is to do what's best for the students of Enfield. Last year, parents came before the board stating that students needed to be back in school five days a week. He found a way to get our students back in school five days a week by mandating masks in all of Enfield Public Schools. He gave them what they were asking for, but now it sounds like it's not good enough. These parents accuse our board members of not supporting their fight to unmask our kids or not being brave enough to stand up to the executive orders. I am proud of the board members who stand up for their own beliefs. Proud of members who are brave enough to say they will wear a mask and continue to wear their masks because it is something they believe in. I see this as a way for them to show me that they care about me and support my children, that they are listening to the CDC's recommendations and continuing to support the findings that say masks are helping to keep our students safe. I have to stop you right there. That's Thank fine. You. Anyone else? Uh, Regina LeBlanc, 22 David Street. First of all, I want to say that I find it appalling that people have criticized teachers and what they're teaching, but then clap for them when they're done talking. I also find it appalling that the same three people call out Ms. LeBlanc after a comment made about last meeting. It's because she spoke out and she had the courage. You say agree to disagree, but because you don't like the answer, you continue to say something about it. It's appalling that when the camera's shut off and the TV's off after this meeting, you're the first people to run up to her telling her how much you respect her. It's kind of interesting. Also, she's one of the only board members that answers your questions and gets the answers that you need. But again, when you don't like the answer, you use it against her. Board members, please continue to fight and stand up for what you want. Thank you. Anyone else? And again, after you speak, please put your name in. Uh, you got it? Okay. Okay. 
Marcy Telesio, 23 Coolidge. I have a lot to spew out. First, I want to um, react to human sexuality being taught. It's always been taught. I'm a little bit confused why this year we're more concerned. Is it that you think that black sexuality versus white sexuality is going to be somewhat different? Um, I, I don't quite understand that. Uh, because you're concerned about CRT and the assignments. Uh, I don't know. That would be fun to hear about. Um, I want to, again, I'm going to thank Chris and Andy uh, for doing everything that they have done and continue to do. Um, you know, there are people in the audience who mock us thanking you. Um, but, you know, we're not going to stop thanking you because you take our kids' lives seriously, as you should, um, and their education, most importantly. Thank you. The teachers have, I, I, I couldn't be a teacher. Um, teachers are amazing. I don't know how they've lived the last couple of years and stayed sane. Uh, from virtual to hybrid to full classrooms, safety, behavior management, creating lesson plans, teaching all the students. That's something that I think is forgotten too when people want to recite policies. Don't pick and choose who they're for. They're for all the students. When we talk about CRT, let's face it, we are different. It's okay to acknowledge different race, differences in race. It is not divisive, rather it's inclusive. With the exception of Amanda, I guarantee no one on this board has a true understanding of the history of black America. And that goes for the audience too. I promise you it is more than just a simple script of slavery, MLK, and the Black Panthers. There is a rich history to teach our children that we are actively withholding because it's uncomfortable for the adults. Being uncomfortable around the discussion of race is okay. Although this is not a political board, sadly, it has become one. Change is hard, but we have hundreds of years of black American history that needs to be shared. But please ask yourself, would you feel the same if I were to fight against the teaching of the American flag, Pledge of Allegiance, or the Pilgrims? And if so, why? Why would that make you uncomfortable? So I'd like to use the rest of my three minutes to allow you to reflect on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Joe Golas. Junior, 31 Stardust Drive in Enfield, Connecticut. First, I'd like to uh, compliment uh, Ms. Cushman and Ms. Cree, um, simply because the last meeting, I thought they had thoughtful uh, solutions to uh, what we face. Secondly, I was in manufacturing in advanced electronics and metals uh, in this state uh, and in Massachusetts. Some of it was defense electronics. So I'm very familiar with science. I also have a degree in chemistry and biology and advanced work in biochemistry, toxicology, and so forth. That doesn't make me an expert, but it does mean that uh, I don't watch uh, TV at night, I read. My comment is simply, I just heard a comment about our race in Enfield, that we don't know the black experience. I was riding a bus, 1959, 
That would make me first grade. We had no pre-kindergarten. And my friend sitting next to me was black. And he turned to me and he said, you know, they're hanging black people down in the South. And they're burning their churches. He said to me, will you protect me? And I said, absolutely. He said, why? Because I said, my father fought in the Second World War. And he fought for every American. He didn't fight for any color of skin. And my grandfather, who came to Enfield, fought in the First World War. And he became a citizen by, here's the rifle, go kill Germans, and when you come back, you're a citizen. I don't know what we're doing in Enfield now discussing this. The issues, I just looked today, so this is recent data, you can check it. China is number one in science and math. United States is number 25 in science. We're number 38 or, uh, uh, on one survey in math. We have countries that are above us. I taught after manufacturing. I helped, unfortunately, I disagree with some of Common Core. I did the standards, NGSS. You know what? Those are the framework. A teacher can fill it in any way they want. And the only reason I want to speak tonight is that I am concerned about science and math. There's only three words that make a good teacher in science and math. Hard work and rigor, R-I-G-U-R. -R. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak? My name is Elizabeth Davis, and I reside at 201 North Maple Street. Kind of wrote a bunch of stuff down I want to cover since it was our last meeting. A lot of that stuff would go out the window since a lot of stuff I heard tonight was pretty disturbing. First, I'd like to just present a few facts. Okay. I know it's hard for people to believe in facts anymore, but it's what our country used to be based upon. Facts on January 6th, our Republican chair, Turner, was at the insurrection. In her own words, coming back from the insurrection, you must be drinking the Kool-Aid, coming home from the rally. It was peaceful. Should be praying for what little of America is left. Give up your seat. You have proven you are easily manipulated. That's to a Republican state rep because he condoned the insurrection. July 29th, J.I. article, Republican Town Chairwoman Mary Ann Turner states, the issue of critical race theory. Now, let me remind you the date on that. I can speak of her. It's okay. She's also elected person, so I can. And these are quotes from a public newspaper. This is a school board meeting, not a... Not July, a, I'm getting to the point. Well, get to the July point. July 20th. Excuse the me. Why don't Forget we restart the, the clock? Get I'm going to get my point. three minutes. July 29th, J.I. article. Back to, again, Republican Town Chairwoman Marion Turner. The issue of critical race theory, CRT, which has become a major talking point, national conservative groups, will be discussed in the school board race. K okay, July 29th. I didn't even know what CRT was when I read that in the paper. It's amazing. That's all I hear everybody talk about. And then to go on to it, calls out our schools and our teachers saying pretty much right here, falsy, that they lie, that we don't teach it. What I'd like to really point out is if we already have people spread and we had it here, which was totally fake and lies, now all of a sudden everybody's coming saying we're teaching it, questioning our educators, our curriculum that's been wrote and approved. Why is that okay? Why do we think that's okay? In our country, how? 
How can we keep spreading this hate and lies and false facts? Kind of like peaceful, right? January 6th trying to overturn our democracy of our country. I turn to each educator, Dresdick, I thank you every single meeting for what you've done and keeping all of us alive. To all you educators and everyone watching home, I salute you. Because I'll tell you right now, if they're serving this great nation for 24 years, I would go back to Afghanistan being shot at, at the front line before I was ever a teacher in this town after watching what you go through. So thank you for taking all this heat, taking the abuse from people, having half these people that are running for your election not even show up to talk to you. You guys realize you represent our school. You don't want to know what our educators do? That's acceptable? Yes, I'm looking at one side. I'm a little shocked on one person for not doing it. This is unacceptable. I still have 30 seconds because you took my time. I'm giving it to you. Thank you. So the point is, thank you so much for all that you guys do. Please know. You might have loudness from the other side, but you have way more parents that respect you, we back you, we believe in you, and we will be there to the end for you. Please remember that. Do not let the hate overcome. Please know we love you. We got your back right to the end. And that's my word of honor to you. Anyone else? My sister's a teacher. I love teachers. I have no hate to teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, 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 hey. All right. All right. Public communication. Please, please, please. Public communication is done. Let's move on. Board member comments. Ms. Pickett, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, I've picked out my children's next teachers tonight. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I really cannot thank you all enough for what you do each day. Um, you have my support, my children's support, my husband's support. Um, we thank the teachers. But I also want to say that it takes a whole village at the school. So I don't want to undermine you all as teachers, um, but it also takes our administrators, our secretaries, our paras, our lunch aides, our custodians, our OT, PT, speech, social workers, counselors, behaviorists, PBIS coaches, bus drivers, SROs, nurses, and probably others that I've forgotten. Um, but all of you do so much for our kids. So I was asked um, about if I had looked into TED, and I have. And actually what I have found is a bit concerning because many of the, the sources that those sites go to um, seem to not be quite representative of the folks um, that lead the work around equity, inclusion, and diversity. So TED, tolerance, equality, and diversity. Words matter. They have meaning. That's why definitions and common understanding are necessary. So I think so much of the conversations that we've been having around DEI, the struggle is we haven't come up with common definitions of what we're even talking about. So I'm gonna define my words um, and what I stand behind and why TED would not work for me. So tolerance is not a sufficient description of the work that we're doing and the work that needs to be done. I don't want my kids to be tolerant of others. That's a pretty low bar. I want my kids to embrace difference, to grow, to learn, reflect, to have empathy. Tolerance is an imperfect term. There's no single word that captures the solutions needed to create a fair and just society. It's clear that tolerance wouldn't do it. Equality. Equality means same. We're not the same. I don't want to be the same as any of you. Equality doesn't work because it doesn't acknowledge the various experiences, values, cultures, identities that our students, our staff, and our community have. We need to acknowledge students where they are and as they are, not as we want them to be. Diversity. Diversity is a way to ensure representation. It's not the end game. Diversity only works if it's in, a cre in, if it's in an environment that's inclusive and equitable. 
So with that being said, I'm gonna to continue to advocate for us to stick with our equity policy and diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're shaping school climate and culture by ensuring representation, giving students what they need to succeed, and including them in decision-making in our efforts. So many arguments that I hear about freedom and liberty actually aligns to that work. I also wanna make it clear that teaching American history is not CRT. Neither is teaching inclusion, problem solving, critical inquiry, or relationship building. I also wanna kind of give an overview of why this work is so important. I love Enfield, I support the work that's happening, but there's work that needs to be done. Bias and inequities exist in the policies that we've created and the practices that happen in our buildings. Not just around race, gender, ability, language acquisition, socioeconomic status, there's disparities in the data of our town. I'm gonna to share just a few data points with you. We have almost over 5,000 students in our school. 66% of our students are white. 95% of our staff are white. 33.8% are non-white. 5% of our staff is not white. Representation is not happening. Our graduation rates. 94.9% .9 of our white students graduate in four years compared to 78% of our black students and 79% of our students with disabilities. You can look at our academic data, you can look at our suspension data, you can look at our attendance data, the same story is told. So I wanted to be clear that I support this work because the work matters. We need to ensure that we're doing every day for all students. So I stand behind the work of equity and inclusion and I will continue to do that with thinking about how we can do that in a way that doesn't put an extra burden on anybody, um, that it's how we embrace students in school, how we create an inclusive environment for our students and our staff and our community. I also wanna say that I believe in so many of the comments that folks said, our kids come first. We're not well as a society. We can't regulate our kids if we can't regulate ourselves. So we need to work with how we are doing that as adults um, first so our kids can be well in schools. I also wanna share um, around the concerns of safety at our meetings. Um, I think it's really important that not every voice is heard um, and that we need to be thinking of others that might not be represented. So Nick, I wanna say that I stand with you. Um, we also have got a letter from a um, high school students regarding wanting to wear a mask. So Olivia, thank you for sharing your voice. Um, I am a true advocate to ensuring that voice is heard. Um, your voice, even the voices that I don't agree with, your voice is important. That's why we have this process. And actually I hope that we could be more inclusive in how we understand and create decisions um, for our schools. Um, so I'll end with my fun stuff. Friday is Trunk or Treat at Enfield Street School. Um, can't wait to experience school events that has like besides open house that hasn't happened yet. So super excited. Um, thank you and that's it. Thank you. Watch. Miss, Miss, Miss Thurston, please. All right, this has been my last meeting. I think I've said that two other times, and I always seem to come back. Um, but I just want to thank Chris and Andy for the past two years, and Kathy, you are right there with them. I know you are the real boss. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, and to the eight of you here, um, I feel like every week there was a different face. Um, I think there kind of was. Um, but I have enjoyed you know, working with all of you. It has not been easy. It definitely has not been easy. Um, and, you know, just thank you for the support. To teachers, you guys, you guys are phenomenal. You know that. That just, that goes without saying. Um, but what I want to say to the nine people that will be sitting here in a couple weeks, remember why you chose to run. It's not a political gain. It's not about you. It's not about your agenda. It's about the 5,000 students that are in the town of Enfield. You are going to be part of a special team that along with Chris and Andy and the educators in town, Amanda went through just about the entire list. <laughs> you guys all need to work together for the safety and for the best of our students. If that is not something that you can do before you are sworn in, 
no matter you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or what, you need to check yourself at the door and make sure this is why you are going to be sitting here at this table. Yeah. And if it's not, then you do not need you do not need to be here. I will be the first to say I have no children, and I have no children in the school system. I worked in the system. I have family within the school system. You guys are very important to me. I know that I'm a quiet person. I don't say much, but I do listen. I know what's going on. My goal is to make sure that the students, the teachers, and the staff are safe. For me, that will always come first. If I have a question, ask Chris. I am on the phone with him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He's in Florida. I'm on the phone with him. Um, just think about the students. Think about why you're doing this. And I wish you all the best. If you ever need a reminder, just send me an email. I have no problem reminding you. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ryder. Thank you, Mrs. Thurston. You're welcome. Oh, and I'm thank gonna miss your silliness. I know. I'm still gonna miss that. Well, to bookend this term, Stacy did rejoin us because, uh, not to talk about politics, but um, the evening of the election where this board, uh, I'm sorry, a couple of us were appointed, <laughs> a couple of us still standing, um, one of our teammates um, had a health scare, and you stepped in, and thank you for being here for this term. And uh, thank you, Tim Neville, for all the service that you provided to our schools and on this board. Um, so also towards the end of this term, unfortunately, to, to bookend a health matter, we lost Joyce Hall. So again, I want to thank Joyce. Um, this is her last meeting with us here spiritually. Um, and she wanted to run again, and she would have done a great job again. Um, so thank you to Joyce and her family, to Mr. Neville and to his family, um, for all the service that you did for our schools. I also want to thank Nurse Jess for keeping our kids healthy and safe and, and checked out. Um, to the teachers that are here, um, you guys are why I do what I do, um, second only to my two kids. So thank you to everybody that's here that has taught my children or that knows the teachers that have taught my children. One is a pleasure and one is a handful. So <laughs> hopefully you, you got the good one there. Um, but thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you guys do for, I say my kids, but I mean our kids. So here are my PTO updates for the week. Um, last week, just, somebody else has made this point. La last week was the most normal week of school in two years for me. And I know this because I volunteered 26 hours inside of our buildings last week. We had book fair at uh, Eli Whitney. So I was at Eli Whitney for a couple hours, three straight days. We had uh, a walk-a-thon at Eli Whitney on Friday. We had our fantastic Collins Creamery Trunk or Treat event, which was an event for the sister schools of Eli Whitney and Hazard Memorial School. I think every student was there because they hadn't had a Halloween event in two years. Um, we had almost 20 teachers there that opened up their trunks and decorated their trunks. We had a Trunk or Treat event at Collins. We, we have a teacher friend that, that's a part of the Collins family that welcomed us. It, it was amazing. Uh, then I had the football game on Friday. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, I've been the uh, cinematographer for, I do all the coaches film for home games this year. Um, and due to a conflict with uh, Mr. Barassa, somebody quoted him earlier, thank you for that. Um, I'll be there this week for senior night doing the announcements, hoping I do Guy proud. Um, I used to do announcements for the Ramblers game, so I'm, I'm familiar with the, uh, the goings on and I can't wait to be there for senior night for Mrs. LeBlanc and her son. Um, and all of our seniors. Uh, this is our last home game of the season, so I want to invite everybody to come out to that. Tina might say more about that. There's a can drive. You can get discount tickets. I'll let her touch base on that. Um, so at Hazardville Memorial School, again, last week we had our Collins Creamery event. Again, it was a Hazardville and Whitney thing, um, a combined school party. And I, like I said, I think probably all 600 families were there. It was so well attended. It was amazing. Um, 
Hazardville has also posted their Wreaths Across America flyer. You can go to HMS, I'm sorry, EnfieldPTO.com slash HMS if you want to download that flyer and send that in. Uh, we'll talk more about Wreaths Across America as we get closer to the event. Uh, but again, if you want to sponsor a wreath that will be placed here in Enfield, uh, you have to get your orders in by November 30th. Uh, although we do the fundraising year round, um, the cutoff for the December event this year in our town, uh, you just have to have your orders in by November 30th. PJ Day for the kids with cancer at uh, Connecticut Children's. Again, this is a town-wide event. Our bus drivers take part, our, our teachers all take part in PJ Day. That is Friday, December 10th. And uh, Mr. Dresdick's gonna wear his, his PJs this year and uh, everybody at Alcorn <laughs> is gonna get the uh, a waiver so they can all wear their PJs. Um, he did not say that, but we'll talk to him about it later. Um, I took a leap of faith on that. Um, <laughs> I also attended the PTO meeting for Hazardville last week. It was on the 19th. Their next meeting is November 16th. Uh, those meetings are still on Teams for now. Uh, also, Picture Day at HMS is the 29th. That I think is this Friday, which is exciting. That's also a day that report cards will be distributed at the K2 and 3-5 schools. Uh, they also had their Jog Jogtober event uh, on the 21st, which was huge. There was a huge, huge fundraiser for the Hazardville families and their PTO. So thank you for taking part in that. Over at Eli Whitney. Again, we had a, a walkathon on Friday. Um, I was there DJing, cheerleading, cheering the kids on. So good to see everybody and the teachers all week long. I was there every day last week. Um, again, the Collins event was amazing. Uh, their picture day is also this Friday, the 29th. Um, and also, again, pick, our report cards will be distributed at 3, 5, and K2 levels. Um, also, this is a school event. Um, it is at the high school tomorrow. There's a Meet the Candidates event. And I mentioned that under my Eli Whitney comments um, because we want to encourage all students grade four and up to come to that event to get a chance to meet the folks that are running for town council uh, and town constables. And I think Board of Ed folks will be there as well. Yep. Um, so uh, again, we'll be at the high school tomorrow from six to eight uh, in the cafeteria. Uh, so please, uh, we encourage all of our students from grade four and up to come out uh, to meet the candidates, to ask a question. Uh, some of them actually have assignments from their teachers, you know, that they have to go or to get something signed that they asked a question. Um, but it, it's a good time um, and they get a chance to talk to the candidates um, that will represent not only their schools, but their town as well. Um, the next Eli Whitney PTO meeting, uh, oh, I don't have the date for that, but the last one was the 18th. Um, and again, book fair, three days live, in person, not virtual. First in-person book fair that we had done since that very same calendar week two years ago. Because as we know, before the spring book fair rolled around, um, we were all home learning in our PJs, like Mr. Dresdick will wear on December 10th. Um, so again, it's been a rough term, um, but I, um, <laughs> I wanted to thank Walter, not just for this term, but for the last four years working together. We often disagreed philosophically on how to get to an end result, but we didn't agree on what the end result should be. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for being our chair for the last four years. And I appreciate you reaching out to me on many occasions to have chats. Um, we didn't talk as much as I would like at times, but um, I will see you Thursday. We'll make a date and go over to Parkman, and judge some pumpkins together. <laughs> um, and we don't respond to what's said, but what is said sometimes from the audience is said, you know, meeting after meeting. Um, so I just wanted to say to those that accuse us of not thinking critically just because we don't agree with you, that is ludicrous. I think critically as well. I don't agree with you on the masks. Um, and I, I don't apologize for that. I have an unvaccinated student at home. Uh, once he is vaccine eligible, he'll get the vaccine and then we'll have a little bit more leeway like Representative Arnone said, um, he doesn't think this will get extended again beyond February. And I think between now and February, we get more kids vaccinated. Um, you know, we'll see what happens after that. But when somebody said, you know, Mr. Ryder asked me, why do I come here? You didn't finish. See, you, you got your dig in, but you didn't complete the sentence. Um, I was asking why you were coming to the school board meeting versus going to Hartford or speaking to the governor, because yes, we do have to follow the laws and a mandate is a law with a sunset clause. It's still a law. Uh, yes, yes, it, that's the very definition please, of it, and please. we don't go back and forth. You guys have been great the whole meeting. We can't have back and forth, please. That's, that's, that's what it is, sorry. Um, so, and 
when Mrs. LeBlanc earlier was lumped in with uh, being compared to Nazis, I take offense to that. That's, that's garbage. So, Tina, you're not a Nazi. Thank you for not being a Nazi, and I appreciate you not being a Nazi. Thank you for that. Um, okay, please, no, please. Again, we don't go back and forth. An you had your turn. We give you guys an opportunity, and it's I the I took my notes. You take your notes. Okay. And uh, we, I, yeah, I have seven pages, front and, front and back. Um, and we mentor at lunchtime, so Mr. Genitis, if you're wondering why I pull my mentee out of class during English, I don't. We mentor at lunchtime. Just you. No, I'm, well, nobody else mentors on this board that, except me. So just letting you know, we mentor at lunchtime. Uh, there's nothing more important than the kids' education when they're in that building. But yeah, I, I've had a mentee that I've been with. Uh, this is our sixth school year together. So um, I don't apologize for um, talking about Marvel movies and playing cards and playing Uno in the JFK main office when, you know, these kids sometimes need a friend. And so we'll go hang out at lunchtime or at recess. Um, which we did at Parkman because he had recess and lunchtime back to back, so that was our hour together. Um, and for you know half of tonight's commentators to start off with the exact same sentence, I want to advance critical thinking in our community. Is that using critical thinking? That you all have the same openers? That you're all sharing notes? So please, please, please. I'm answering the questions. You said, please answer our questions. It's the last board meeting. It's the, the chatter needs to please. stop. It's it the last board please. meeting of the term. Where you're getting your questions answered. I thought you'd be happy. My goodness. Oh, please, goodness. I'm asking you. Yikes. Anything else, Mr. Ryder? Um, no, I just, uh, just want to get everybody's answers out there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. See you Tuesday. Ms. LeBlanc. Okay, I'm going to start off with the school stuff, the reason we're all here. Um, Enfield High is going to have their annual auction with a twist. It's called the Jingle Jam. It's going to be on Saturday, December 4th. Look out for tickets. And it's going to be a great event at the Elks Club. Um, last week, Enfield High had their Spirit Week. There were a lot of uh, fun events, and the kids were actually able to have a pep rally uh, this year, which was a lot of fun to see the pictures on Twitter. Um, like Mr. Ryder said, Enfield High Football Senior Night um, is going to be this Friday night at 7 p.m. I heard the weather is not supposed to be so great. Um, but what the gridiron is doing, um, tickets for adults into the game are $7. And if you bring an item of food, uh, it'll all be donated to the food shelf. And per item, you get a dollar off uh, the admission ticket. So if you bring seven items, you get into the game for free, um, which is a great way for us to support our food shelf. Um, the Enfield High Homecoming uh, dance was last Thursday. It was kind of an interesting dance, but they had a dance. It was outside on the patios. It was under the stars. Um, I loved uh, seeing the kids in uh, their dresses and dressed up. It was an outdoor event, and um, I think the kids were truly just glad to feel like they were getting back to normal. Um, this 30, Thursday, uh, there is a parent equity leadership meeting um, from 6 to 7. Um, that is a group at the high school that allows parents to call in and be part of an equity team um, with teachers, administrators, and fellow parents. Um, I had on the, the list about the Parkman Mini-Me contest, so I am very excited to go um, place my judge, uh, or, or my, the pumpkin, I think. Um, that is going to be very hard for me to have to pick just one. Um, the other note I wanted to say is, um, so me and Walter, what, six years? Six years. Uh, so Walter and I have been on the board together for six years. And um, this particular term, we definitely didn't see eye to eye. Um, but one of the things about Walter is he is a dedicated board member. He will go to every meeting no questions and just be there. He may not always say something, but you know he's there and he's there to support his board. He mentioned, and I thought this was a great memory, um, when there was the issue with the weight set. And then what was the other thing you were doing with the bottle caps? Did you mention that with the so Oh, no, I didn't. You're right. Yeah, he was doing uh, drilling I'll bottle caps I'll bring it up my for the Stowe Early Learning Center. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, um, although there's been a bit of a divide, um, you know, Walter uh, always tries to keep his heart in the right place. And, um, you know, I'm going to miss him. And I think his family's going to be happy to have him back because um, Walter's made some tough choices to be here because he took this job very seriously. So, Walter, thank you very much. Next, I want to thank Stacy. And actually, Walter saw your name tag out and he says, Tell Stacy to save it for when she has to come back. <laughs> um, uh, but thank you, Stacy, uh, for filling in and, um, and serving. It was a very difficult term. And I really appreciate your support and your encouragement and your kind words. And although you talk about how you didn't speak up. You spoke up when you felt like you needed to. Yes. On the most important issues. So I would like to thank you for your service because this is a crazy time, right? So I wrote a few things down. Um, and this is another housekeeping item, Miss Monroe. I told you that I would get some answers regarding your questions about what was how we were handling um, the school buildings during the time of COVID. So this is what I have for now. Um, if you need more information, um, we can, you know how to get a, a hold of me via email. So buildings and grounds repair to replace multiple exhaust fans, added exhaust fans in COVID isolation rooms, opened up all outside air dampers and extended ventilation run times in all schools. All air filters were replaced prior to the start of school and are on a quarterly replacement schedule. So if you want more information than that, then please get in touch with me and I will do my best to get that information back to you. So uh, tonight, it's our last meeting of this sitting board. Get one last look at all of us because there's gonna be uh, some, some new ones up here. Um, I don't know which one of us will be here, but um, I wanted to say first and foremost, I would like to thank the Enfield Public School students, families and staff. And when I say staff, I mean everyone from teachers to bus drivers to secretaries to calf workers to parents to nurses to administrators, everyone, thank you. You have worked through unprecedented times with our kids, greeting them, whether it be on a screen with a smile and a determination to make things as best as you possibly can. Secondly, I would like to take a moment to thank both Mr. Dresick and Mr. Longy. What I'm thankful for is that during this last two years, you communicated with parents the directive you were taking and why. You stated this clearly and timely, and thank you for keeping the health and safety at the forefront, and thank you for continuing to do so. I would like to clear up one item um, that's been said. Um, it's been said, I, I would like people to know that the moving of Head Start and the Eagle Academy was all the brain work of Mr. Dresick and his academic team. It is not something the elected official should be taking credit for. I wish I had the idea, but that wasn't, that wasn't how it went. Mr. Dresick and team recognized that all pre-K kids needed to be afforded equality when it came to STEAM programs. Having all the littles, I like to call them littles, in one building would make for an amazing preschool experience for all. Further, Mr. Dresick and his academic team wanted the special education students that were being educated in other districts to be able to come back to Enfield. Mr. Dresick and the academic team established programs at the, through the Eagle Academy to bring Enfield students back to Enfield, to be educated in the community they live in, and so they could get involved in school extracurricular activities and more and not have long bus rides. Thank you, Mr. Dresick and your team. We must give credit where credit is due. It has been said that perhaps some sitting board members have led and taken on this position with emotion. When you've spent the better part of 17 years with your own kids attending Enfield Public Schools, you establish that emotional connection. And it becomes a balance as you establish connections with parents, staff, and the community. I can't tell you how beneficial I feel that has been to me as a board member. When your kids attend Enfield Public Schools, you have a deeper understanding of what Enfield Schools means to families and students in Enfield. I believe when you are involved in the community, you appreciate and celebrate the diverse community we live in and the students who attend our schools. Whew. Okay. Kind of a theme for tonight. As the term ends, I look over at Jonathan, my nephew, 
And I hope that we, in some way, can represent what life used to look like before we had to choose sides and dig our heels in. That when you put love and respect ahead of politics, you can still be family. John knows where I stand on issues, and I know where he stands. Sometimes they align, and sometimes they don't. And that's OK. That is what can make democracy great, that we can sit up here, disagree, and give each other space in our political beliefs without hating one another. It's not often an aunt and a nephew can take this journey together. So thank you for being you. Lastly, this term has been unique as we navigated through a pandemic, witnessed the greatest local political divide I can remember, and having had one board member resign for health issues, three board members resign, and one sadly passing away. What we endured was unprecedented as parents. What I learned is, is life is short. We don't know how long we will be here. We have to listen a little more and love a little harder. I had taken something out, but somebody said something earlier, and I'm, I'm going to add it back in. For just one minute, look around the room. OK, we have two sides of the room, and we have many people that feel so strongly about issues and what's at the center of it. It's our kids. And we're all fighting for kids and what we believe is right for them. And that's the one thing we have in common in this room, whether we agree or disagree. And it's amazing that the kids in Enfield have people like us that are willing to come to meetings and stand up. Those kids don't know how lucky they are. And they'll learn someday from us, no matter what side of the aisle we sit on. So somebody had brought that up earlier, and I thought that was a good way to look at it. So I'm going to finish. <laughs> um, it has been an honor for me to serve the Enfield community and uh, the teachers and the public school staff and the families for uh, the last 10 years. And I feel like I have been able to come into my voice and represent and advocate for some of our most vulnerable students. Nicholas, thank you for writing that email. I am your ally. It has been an honor to represent all the wonderful students and the amazing staff that makes up Enfield Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. LeBlanc. Oh, well, first and foremost, um, Thank you, Aunt Tina, for those words. Um, <laughs> it was, um, I didn't know what I was getting into when I came to the Board of Education and you were there to guide me not only through my, my first uh, campaign and election cycle, but the full entirety of these two years too. And I look uh, forward to continuing on another two years. Um, to some um, other points and I don't necessarily agree with Scott all the time, but he just made a comment that I have to defend that he took a little bit of heat in this room for. He said that he, when somebody asked why, why are you, the whole thing, with why are you here? And Scott said, well, you didn't finish my comment. And I don't know, I wasn't there. I don't know what the circumstances were, but you have to go to the governor. And, and Scott's right because government 101 the legislative is your lawmaking body. The Connecticut legislator, legislative branch, voted, your legislators voted to give power to Governor Lamont to allow him to make laws under emergency powers that are now mandates. So they took away making laws, put it in the hands of Lamont, and like Mr. Ryder said, now it's a sunset clause where until those emergency powers are up, Governor Lamont's mandates are technically laws because your legislative body gave up their legislative duty. They made the decision to take away any possible decision this board or local districts had. And that's where it comes down to. On to some other, there was a, there was a lot tonight and, and I thought it was unique because th there was, people from 
both sides who came up and said, these are facts, or I have the facts, or I have this study, I have that study, which is probably all true. The truth lies somewhere in between each and every one. And um, it's interesting because even though I tend to agree with some in this room more so than others, as I look out into the room, we can all agree to disagree. Half of us are masked, half of us are not masked, right? So where's, <laughs> where's that truth in the middle, right? And personally, I believe that truth in the middle lies with the philosophy that everybody is capable of making their own choice, right? I've, I've spoken previous meetings many times before about how I feel about the mask, right? You guys know that. But if, it, it, again, I, I kind of just hit the point I was trying to get at is each to each their own, the decision can lie with each individual. Um, I think that's going to, in time, when they, with the news the superintendent brought up about the 5 to 11 now being vaccinated and whether you agree or disagree, you're going to get your child vaccinated, whether you're not, that's not my my prerogative to, to get into your household life on decisions you make. But I think that when that time comes, we will be living in a society that's very much um, down that middle road. And honestly, <laughs> that's hopeful because um, the division is, is pretty unreal right now. So if there is a middle that we can come to, I think that's better off for us as a country. Um, to our teachers, um, one of the things I, I thought was very unique um, was the fact that when you were given your home addresses when you, when you had to speak was that the majority of you all gave Enfield addresses. And that says a lot because you, I don't think, and, and I've been in a couple of school systems, you, 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 don't, you don't see that very often where your own staff also resides in your own town. So the impact is there, right? It's not just you're there for six hours a day, you get in your car and you're driving to your hometown. No, you're driving five minutes up the road to your house in Enfield. And that says a lot. So uh, I commend you all. And um, I think Enfield's a great town, um, not only for what you do in the schools, but for what you do outside the schools when you're not in your profession. Um, to our superintendent, I did, I did have one question that I just want to, you can get back to me on this, but um, I just want to out on public record um, about iPad usage in the classrooms. And I know we discussed maybe, you know, tailing back a little bit on, on the usage. And I, there was a, a couple parents that were concerned still about the usage of the iPads in the classrooms and how they weren't necessarily getting away from them as much as they thought they would, especially given the, the whole remote situation last year. They were looking to get back into a more um, traditional school setting with pens and paper. And I don't know what where the truth lies in that, but just kind of some kind of um, update. And I'm sure if I ask Michelle Middleton, she'll be, she'll be the first to uh, give me a straight answer too. So um, between the two of you, if I could just get some kind of update on where things stand with that. We can have a conversation after more specifics of where you're hearing this from, because it may vary from level to level. So, and then lastly, um, to Walter, thank you um, for everything you have taught me um, as chairman of the board. Um, we come from two unique perspectives. You know, um, you've been here a lot longer than I have, and have a lot more experience, and it was so valuable, everything that you taught me um, about how the way the board operates and works. And if it wasn't for you, I, I even put a thing on Facebook and I said, I've learned so much over, over the last two years and a huge, a tremendous amount of that learning has come from you. So I thank you for that. And to Stacy, how can you not thank somebody who sat up here and get served? It's it's a volunteer position, and you came in a time when the board was almost brand spanking new, right? And you came in, and um, you you saw as much of the transition of this board over the last two years as a few of us have up here. 
and you've been through the hard times, you've been through the good times, um, and through it all, um, I think overwhelmingly, the majority, um, the majority of the time, we we could find common ground on a, on a lot of issues. So I thank you for your service to the Board of Education and to the town of Enfield. Now, um, also a congratulations to the girls uh, JFK soccer team who, tr who finished a tremendous season. Uh, so uh, congrats to them and, and the success of their season. And as I, as I always do, um, my kite updates um, from Brianna Beckster in. We have uh, We Spy posters have started going into businesses, so keep an eye out for them around town. I, I haven't seen one yet, but I'm really eager to uh, go into my first business and find one. They, I'm sure they're out there. Um, there is still time to apply for the Parent Leadership Academy. If you're interested, reach out to Melissa Griffith at, I'm going to spell out the email, M-A-L-I-S-S-A-R-O-Y at cox.net. Third, Stowe's FEO had Peg Oliveira from Yale come to speak with families about creating bedtime routines. Kite partnered with Enfield Public Schools and ECDC to offer bedtime book boxes for ED ECDC pre-kindergarten families. 60 families received a box to decorate with decorating supplies, flashlight, a book, parent book recommendation list, and an unboxing video by Elise Snow, JFK student. Families can share their creations on Stowe's Flipgrid page. And I know how fl big Flipgrid is to, um, to uh, Brianna and to the Kite community and, and how much they use it. So I, I'd love to see um, some of those uh, uploaded as well. F finally, uh, the November Kite Collaborative Meeting is next Wednesday at 5.30 via Zoom. You can RSVP with Brianna at B Beckstrand, that's B-B-E-C-K-S-R-T-S-T-R-A-N-D at Enfield.org, B Beckstrand at Enfield.org. That's all for tonight. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. Cree. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank all the parents and concerned residents of Enfield for coming out uh, to the meeting tonight. It shows that you care about your children's health, your future, and their education. I would also like to give kudos to the teachers of the Enfield Public Schools for all that you do for the children. I do know the dedication and hard work that goes into being a teacher. I taught for 40 years, so I know how the job works. And that, you know, it can be thankless at some times, but it can also be wonderful, okay? Um, and parents, yes, we, as a board, we really do listen to you and all your concerns, okay? We do listen, we discuss, we research, okay? So we can help solve these matters that have been lingering for a couple of months. Now, with the newly elected board on November 2nd, I hope these concerns will be addressed and these matters will soon come to a resolution, okay, in a timely manner, um, so that we will have a productive school year and people will not be upset about whether children should wear masks or not wear masks, whether they should be vaccinated and so on and about the curriculum and lessons. So I hope these things will be resolved soon. I would like to thank this board for the warm welcome that I received. I've only been here for a short time and it was an honor and privilege for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cree. Ms. Cushman. I am thankful for the opportunity to serve on this board and for the many, many people that I've had the chance to meet and, the, and the, even the um, opportunities that I've had to reach out through our Parkman PTO to be a blessing to the teachers. Thank you for coming. Um, 
There has been some things that have been a concern that have come up, certainly. And though there may be differences of opinions about whether we want to pursue the DEI curriculum, you know, focus or TED, truly, we can all agree that our goals are the same, what we want to see for our children and who they are, you know, what kind of environment they're in. And yet, these policies do um, warrant some examination because as we've had an opportunity to talk with parents, not just parents that come here, because there are certainly parents that don't come out of fear, just out of discomfort, fear about what might happen to relationships within the schools with their peers or with teachers, that there are there is another voice that we're you know not hearing. And when they're telling us about assignments, say for example in the high school, about a whiteness project, that's alarming. So I just, and these are, I mean, these are things that the teachers are, you know, that parents are sharing based on what their students, what their, what their children are coming home and sharing. So I'm, I want to agree that we have the same goals, but it's, we need to just examine how we're going about reaching those goals to make sure that we're allowing our children to be in an environment that's not discriminatory one that where they're treated equally and they're all seen as having value. Um, I have submitted to Michelle Middleton based on our conversation that was very positive um, information about FAIR's K through 12 curriculum um, for them to look into the, that does um, focus on the TED principles. Um, and I also agree when what was spoken at, a, at the last meeting that truly our black history should not be limited to that one month that's black history month because I think we can all agree that we have people of all different backgrounds and races. That's what makes our country the wonderful place that it is because we are so diverse that our, his, that our history has great um, there have been many great people that have had really exceptional investments in our nation that have really had great goals and um, whose lives we need to celebrate. And there are curriculums out there that don't, you know, that aren't specifically just black or specifically just white, but there's ones that encompass them all and celebrate the diversity. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Mr. Ongar. So, unfortunately, at the last meeting, I was unable to attend, and uh, I was called away uh, on business, and uh, I was uh, on the West Coast hours and hours away. So, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't I couldn't attend, but I did watch the uh, the meeting and listen to everyone speak and um, I'm just amazed at how articulate everyone is it's just it's very impressive so um, regardless of what what your case is it's just uh, amazing so I'm going to start here with um, with the sensitive stuff I've got a couple of sensitive things I just want to talk about so um, quickly the first one has to do with a rumor, okay? And I'm glad that the teachers are here. I didn't know that all the teachers were gonna be here, so this is great. So, um, at the last board meeting that I was at, that afternoon, um, I had, someone had communicated to me that there was a rumor going around that if the Republicans were elected, that we were going to fire Chris Dresick. That this was the rumor. And I was like shocked, shocked to hear that. I said, you're kidding. And I was they're like, no, no, that's what that's what's going around. So um, no one. No one on this Republican board has ever discussed firing Chris Dresick or anyone in our administration. As a matter of fact, after that meeting, after that board meeting, I approached Chris asked for his time, 
a minute of his time. He was accommodating with his time. Thank you, Chris. And said, Chris, I heard a rumor. I heard an ugly rumor that if we're elected, we're going to fire you. And I want you to know, Chris, that that's absolutely untrue. There's not an ounce of truth in that. And none of us have ever discussed that. And we wouldn't fire anybody unless there was some just cause to fire somebody. But we supported Chris Dresick through the most demanding times that the school system has probably ever seen and hopefully ever will see. And um, so I wanted to go on record here tonight to say if you've heard that, it's just not true. And so I had to ask myself, who would start that and why would they start that? And I don't know the answer to that, but it's something to think about. Okay, that's number one. The second sensitive item was uh, with regard to um, our support of the teachers. Okay, I want you to know everybody on this board loves the students and everybody loves the teachers. What would a school be without students? What would a school be without teachers? And I'm personally sensitive to teachers, okay, because I have. Um, as many of you know, um, uh, a family member who is a teacher in the Enfield school system. And we have always supported teachers because we recognize how important teachers, teachers are. They're the kind of people who want to give of themselves to bring someone from one place to another place. And they're gifted and gifted people to be able to do that. And so to suggest that we don't, we don't care about our teachers um, is just, again, not true. It's not true at all. We love our teachers. Now, something came up about um, not participating in a teacher event, okay? And I'll discuss that just a little bit. We had received a questionnaire. And in that questionnaire, there were a variety of questions that, you know, talked about uh, this came from the Enfield Teachers Association, came from the, um, the Enfield Teachers Union, essentially. And it was asking us, essentially, would you will you pledge, meaning board members, would we pledge to uh, support the educators in collective bargaining rights? Now, this is us going out on record prior to any negotiations or contract negotiations, giving a pledge that we're going to support the teachers. Now, we're all elected individuals here. We represent the interest of the taxpayers, the uh, town, the state, the administration. Explain that. You had a chance to explain that. The top line. You didn't read it. Please. Oh, please. Please. No back and forth. Read the whole, read the whole please. Down. Please. Let him finish. Let him finish. Why? So, will you pledge to include the ETA in discussions surrounding all the matters related to? So, if you go through the list of questions, I'm speaking, I'm speaking for our side here now, okay? We were sensitive to that. We don't know, and, and what I'd like to see is when the new board comes, that we could go to the administration, the superintendent, perhaps our attorney, and be provided with some guidance with regard to our roles in answering and addressing these types of, um, of questions with, with, the, with, the, with the teachers' union, okay? So um, my dealings with the teachers' union have always personally have always been fair, and I've seen that, um, Bill, I've seen you speak many times, several times, and I've always thought that you were fair and, and considerate in everything that you had said and in, in addressing everyone, okay? So I'm just saying that's, that's how I see you, all right? So this was a concern for us. Can I speak? This was a concern for us, and this is why we didn't, we didn't participate in the Zoom call because we had concerns about the nature of these questions and how it related to us and how we represent the board and the community with regard to that. It does, please don't misinterpret, please don't misinterpret that it's because we don't care about teachers because that is, that's not, 
Uh, that's not the truth. So I wanted to address that. Um, I think I'll end with this. I'll, you know, I want to finish this. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to the less sensitive stuff now, okay? Which... I can't... No. Please, 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 please. It's not campaigning. It's not campaigning. Please. We're addressing why we didn't attend. There's a legal issue that we want addressed. All right, but continue. you're addressing something that isn't involving continue all of the, the next, five, not five of the next, you. Let them continue the next thing, all right. please. So before, so in my last thing I attended, I did attend the Enfield Open House at the invite of the career counselors at the Enfield High School. And this is uh, um, Colleen uh, Signiglio and Jamie Botterman. Uh, they are the career counselors. They have degrees in school and counseling, second degree, secondary degrees in career counseling. And what I was very impressed with the work that they're doing, our career counselors are doing at Enfield High School. Um, they meet between 10 and 18 Enfield High School juniors every day. They interview those students to determine where their interests are, and they help guide them to learn more about their potential careers. And they try to have at least one or two career representatives come in to speak each week on the students' interests. So recently they had, and I saw her speak here t tonight, um, Regina LeBlanc, she spoke on uh, nursing. And um, Dr. Bell is gonna speak this week. He is a veterinarian. He's coming in to speak from the animal hospital. And there'll be uh, about 30 people in to see that. Michelle uh, Lewandowski is be speaking, uh, an instructor at the veterinary assistance. Uh, Jess Poirier, representing the workforce development and continuing education at Enfield uh, at Aznantak Community College. So, um, and then later this week on Friday, they're gonna have three speakers come in for uh, the Life Star, uh, which is the hospital helicopter. And uh, they're going to talk all about all about that as far from a career standpoint. But they've had career speakers on real estate, fire science repression, uh, and, and and the military of students we're interested in. But the one thing is that um, they're asking for if if you here represent a certain um, career that uh, could be of interest to our students, then you could be a potential speaker at our career uh, institute. So go on the Enfield Public Schools, go to Enfield High School, go to uh, departments, and then you'll see the Career Center. Click on that, and then you'll be able to, um, and, and, and you'll be able to do that. Do be fair to me. If I've been fair to you, be fair to me. Please, please, no back and forth, please. No back and forth. Please, no back and forth. No, continue. Okay, all right. But I, I, I'm going to do that, though. Um, okay. Please, again, you guys have been great all meeting. Don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. And... And finally, I'll just I'll just leave it at this. I had a, um, and it has to do with the teachers because I wrote this. I, I wrote this. I didn't know that you were all going to be here, but it was a, current, a concern that I had about you because we do love our teachers, and so I'm concerned about the level of stress that's being placed on you, our teachers. <laughs> and I want to look into what we can do to help our teachers relieve some of the pressure that's currently being placed on you. And for a long time now, there's been a huge amount of stress placed on our teachers. They've had to navigate through this pandemic, remote learning, and now they're back in person. And public schools are experiencing staffing shortages. Teachers are continually having to cover classes for other teachers who are not there. And now, due to shortages of substitute teachers, teachers are being forced to use whatever prep time or duty time you have to provide coverage for other classes. Our teachers, some of our teachers, are getting stressed out and getting burned out. And not only does that impact them personally, but it also impacts the quality of education that our students are receiving. And I think this deserves greater attention, and I'd like to see this board take a closer look at what, we, what could be done to help our teachers. Thank you. And and Bill, I, I will read that line, okay? Um, 
please, this is the candidate questionnaire and the, and the top line that Bill's referring to says, please feel free to explain your yes or no answer with a narrative. So you provided an opportunity to explain it yes or no, but our issue was with regard to the legality of the whole thing. So thank you. That was our position. I wanted to add some balance to it, why we weren't there, why we didn't support the Zoom meeting, that's why. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunger. Anyone else? Okay. So unfortunately, this is my last meeting. Fortunately for my wife, it's my last meeting. So I do want to thank my wife. Well, first I want to thank God. God's given us the liberty for us to sit here and represent the school. So secondly, I want to then thank my wife, thank my mother-in-law who's here also. I want to thank my father who always questioned why I'm doing this. Anytime the phone would ring and it was Mr. Dresick while I was at his house, he's like, why are you doing this? But I told him it was to give back to the town, a town that I've been, I've been a part of since 1973, believe it or not. I lived in East Windsor up to 1990, but my father started a business here in 1973 at the old casket building, which I still ashamed that it burned down, but it is what it is. Spent seven years there, and it was a second home to us. But my father literally put 16 hour, 16 hour days in so we, we could have what we could have and to grow his business. And there was times that he would babysit us there, so. But with that being said, and then we also had, then we went into uh, Peerless Tool, was in that business from, from 1980 on. And again, I, I've always called Enfield my second home until I moved here in 1990, and it's become my home. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, I'll come back to that later. So I wanted to give back to this town. I know it's only been six years. I knew almost two years ago, in November of 2019, when, we, when I took my second term as chairman, I knew that was going to be my last term. So for those that thought it was for the resignation stuff that was going on, it had nothing to do with it. I knew then that this was going to be, it was going to be my last term. It's a, it's a like, it's an unwritten rule on our side that the chairman only serves two terms. So I just follow what, what was presented before us. I want to thank my kids also, Robert, Janina, and Grace Maria for the time that they, they, gave, they, they let me serve here. I started over at, in Jonathan's seat. I celebrated my 50th birthday in Jonathan's seat. I saw my wife's birthday. I sat here one year because it conflicted. I had, we had the uh, candidates discussion at the high school on my wedding anniversary. So I give it up what I, and I, because I cared for the town. The only meeting I missed was my, uh, uh, my original swearing in. I got sworn in by the town clerk a week before because we were going down to spend Thanksgiving with my daughter down in Florida, who was uh, down at FIU. That was the only meeting I missed. I made every subcommittee meeting. When I was back on the, on the uh, Enfield High Building Committee meeting, there was a time I was, I'll say it, I was in the hospital, and they were already panicking. What are they going to do? I got out that Thursday, and that Thursday night, I was at the meeting. I was the first one at the meeting. So I do care. I do care about this town. I want to thank before Mr. Drazek, I want to thank Dr. Schumann for his time when he served here. And then Mr. Longy, who served as Enfield High uh, Principal, where I got to know him, where where uh, I made a phone call to him when my, my daughter was getting a picture taken. and. And he took care of a problem for me right away. We won't get into details. <laughs> but then I want to thank Mr. Dresick, who was the deputy assistant at the time, but it was now the superintendent. He's, we, we've been, we, he calls me once a week, twice a week, three times a week. I have a, I have a stored message here from 
September 10th, 2018, that he left me at 2.30 in the morning, and that night was the night that we lost a student, Justin Brady. And that next morning, I rushed over to the high school to see whatever I could do to help. I sat in the auditorium with this, with, with then Aaron Clark was uh, putting the, the teachers together on whatever we could support we needed. So we, we, we've had the lows. We've had a couple other students pass away, went to the wakes, whatever it needed to be done. Um, we had the highs. We had a... Uh, uh, a board member who literally gave birth between meetings. She was at a meeting and within two weeks gave birth and came to the next meeting. So we've, we've had we've had up and downs. We did, I did, we had a member pass away, Joyce Hall. We miss her dearly. We've had some resignations. We've had some reappointments. Again, back to Mr. Dresick. Thank you for all you do. You, this this last two years, this last term, this term was the hardest of all. All you've done with your assistant superintendent now. Phenomenal team, and I, I just there's no words for what you guys do, and it's it's God bless you. I bless all the teachers too. Thank you for what you do. I tried to come out to the schools. Before the pandemic, I tried to go more. I wish I could have came during the pandemic, but I did reach out, and I do plan to make one more run through before the before the uh, before they kick me out of my term, and I have to take this pit off, which I wear proudly. And um, all the subcommittee meetings that we, you know, all the work is done in subcommittee meetings, and all the subcommittee meetings. I want to thank the joint facility committee with. We started that with Deputy Mayor Suzak, Tim Neville, and myself. Started that committee, went through all the buildings, and the, the committee's grown since then with more members on that committee. I want to thank the, the Joint Facility Committee also worked on the JFK pre-ref the second time through to get that, excuse me, to get that approved. That is one thing I'm going to miss that I will not be here to finish that project, but I already warned them that I'm going to be in the public at those meetings too. So, so honey, I'm not done with meetings yet. So, <laughs> But um, I want to thank my, my past vice chairman, Charlotte Riley, Wendy Costa, Mr. Un uh, John Ungeyer, Tina also said she, she sat in this chair for six years that I've been here. She hasn't moved. So thank you for being a great secretary. I want to thank our new mem newest member on the, this side, uh, Ms. Pickett, Mr. Ryder. Ms. Durston, I, was, I looked back at old meetings, and I looked back four years ago, and you cried at that meeting, and this time you made it through without crying. So. I did. She knows she'll be back. <laughs> but that's, that's what I warned. We keep we keep the uh, keep the name tag because you will be back. I, that's right. I, th I think Brian's already called Chris and said, please just keep her. I don't know. So if you want to write her in on the on the ballot, you can do that too. So. <laughs> but don't write me in. <laughs> I want to thank my, my my colleagues here too. It's been great working with you. I didn't know everything, but I want to add, and I'm probably going to start crying myself. The person that sat here before me, he was, my knowledge, he was, I, I, he helped me during the, the first term that I, that I uh, served. And he was always available. And I miss him dearly every day. But he was, He was my rock when I sat here next to him, serving as his vice chair. And and his wealth of knowledge, I may have absorbed 10% of it. I mean, he just, so, so Jonathan, if anything, whatever I taught you is what Tom taught me. So I just carried it on, so.
I'm going to miss you all. I'm going to miss this seat. I know we disagreed, but we mostly agreed. But that's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all. I wasn't expecting that. Thank you very much. That's not why I. So, with that said, let me. We're going to go now. Thank you all again for what you guys do every day. It means it means so much to me what you guys do. Thank you for coming out. I'm going to take a little breather here and let them. Oh, I forgot one person in particular. I'm not well, I'm not done yet, so <laughs> thank you again, folks, for coming out. I forgot one important person that's the glue to this whole operation over here. Literally the glue. Mrs. Zalaki, without you sending me those agendas on Thursdays before the meeting and and calling me up and saying, hey, dummy, I sent you the, and she didn't say that, but I, but that's, I know that's what she meant. I sent you an agenda. How come you haven't answered me? Well, okay, I, I apologized, but like, like uh, Ms. Thurston said, you are the glue that holds us all together. Keep that central office running, and this town owes you a great a dark, uh, gratitude, so thank you. All right. Yes, I know. Oh, is there something we got to do at 10 o'clock to keep going or no? 10 30. Okay, so we got to finish. So, with that, where were we? Board member comment on finished business? We have none. New business? We have none. Board committee reports. And before we start, I just, again, this is a section that Tom put in. It's important that every committee presents what they do to this, to, at these meetings. So, I want to thank him for that. Yes. So, curriculum. Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, curriculum met. When was it? Um, last Thursday. Last Thursday. Thank you. Um, we discussed um, a project that we'd like to see happen in the future that relates to uh, joint facilities, and uh, we're working behind the logistical aspects of that um, to uh, see student involvement potentially and uh, other aspects that could relate to the educational system. So that's what I got for that. Thank you. Finance, Mr. Ungar. Uh, yes, the finance committee did. Sorry, the finance committee did meet on October 18th, and I'll be reporting on that. Okay. Policy, Mr. Unger. Policy uh, did not meet. Okay. Leadership did not meet. Joint facilities is meeting this Thursday, and we're going to go over the what what Mr. LeBlanc said about the lists to to get to the students to work on. JFK would the Another person I forgot to thank, Alex, for all his hard work at these meetings. Could he please put up the... There it is. Okay. So it's my job here to push it forward. Here it is. So this was from the, their last meeting on the 7th. What's in green on the right-hand side is everything turned back to the school, and I believe the gym could be any day now, or it's already back to the school. I'm not sure. 
So the only thing we have uh, have left is the, the Red Wing, which will be back at the end of the calendar year, and then they'll start on the administrative. No, then they'll then they'll start on the uh, the, the, the Green Wing there to get the administrative, because then we can then we can turn over the temporary classrooms back. And they can get those, get that green wing set up for the new administrative wing, and then work on the last administrative wing and the hub. Well, the hub also was supposed to be given back at the end of the year. So, next. Oh, okay. So there we just push a button. I would answer my own question here. So this is looking out. Uh, the red wing is on the left picture. The red wing is on your right, and the black wing is on your left, and that's the outdoor classroom that they made. And that's the new parking lot on the north side that they that they did. The right picture is the the, the outside the ca the new cafeteria, the uh, out, outdoor outdoor little uh, um, area. These are the the fields, which I guess the grass is taken in great because of excuse me all the rain we had this year, and the new basketball courts that are being used already. The auditorium is already been used for a couple of functions. And like I said, the gym, I believe they this was before they had to put one or two more coats of uh, poly down and also get the bleachers in. So, And this is the, the center hub, the old auditorium. And I think that's it. It was a short... No, and this is the work they're doing in the Red Wing. So, the I believe one of the bathrooms on the right, and I believe that's one of the classrooms on the on, on the bathrooms on the left, classrooms on the right. Sorry. Oh, more more Red Wing. That's a hallway. And I oh, and okay, so they did take over the old kitchen after they moved into the new kitchen. So they're already starting on the administrative wing there. And I think that's it. Yep. That's it. So again, I missed that two weeks ago. I apologize. Can I just, I just Please. have a quick question. So you were saying all the kids that are going to be, so all the kids will be in their appropriate wings by what was January the January 1st. By January 1st. So that's great. So then it will be red, uh, white, and blue. So yes. they'll be no longer learning in the temporary classrooms. No, the temporary classrooms will be gone. Uh, um, and then and then they'll be working on, on, uh, Hold on, let's go back. I know you said that was their, oh, that they're ahead of schedule. So is that ahead of schedule for the for the students? No, that's on schedule. That's on schedule. That's on okay. schedule. And I, I already they already turned me off. No, no, oh, no. That's okay. No, I that's just okay. want to go back to that. And just to be clarify, come on. I need a couple more back. <laughs> it could be me too, because I could be too far away. Come on. Oh. Here we go, here we go, here we go. So the right picture is winter 2021. So January 1st, all that green will be turned back over to the school. So the only thing they got left is the new um, administrator, the vice principal, I believe, offices in, in, in the hub that they've got to build. And then they're going to they're gonna start working on the old temporary classrooms in, in the uh, green wing to turn that into the new administrative wing. And they also got permission, oh, that was also brought up. They got permission from the state because the library is too new by a few years right. it would, it, that that we got permission to bring that up so it all looks alike. And they're gonna do some touch-ups on the outside and, and make it all look like one building when they're done, so. Perfect, thank you. And kudos to the uh, Gilbane, they're doing a great job. The architect, they're doing a great job. CSG is it's a phenomenal team. Great job. Joint security, we didn't we didn't meet. No, we we're not going to meet again until December. I believe it's the first Wednesday of the month, eight thirty. Joint insurance, we did meet and we went over something that we ended up not not approving. So, but it was good to go through the the process and 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 again, just so I could bring up. The, the work we've done with that committee of uh, bringing what was a deficit in the town to I think we're right about break even now and we're going to start building the reserves. So that's a, a great job we're doing at that. 
Uh, youth and mental health and wellness, nothing, no other. Me, so, approval of minutes, regular board of ed meeting minutes, October 12, 2021. So moved. Moved by Ms. Thurston, Second. seconded by Ms. LeBlanc. Any discussions? Again, fine minutes prepared by our secretary, Ms. Salaki. Um, all in favor? We have nine in favor, zero against. Number 14, approval of accounts and payroll, Mr. Ungar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the, the Finance Committee did meet. I, I did want to add one thing, that uh, in our Finance Committee meeting, we had um, representatives of the Wolf Financial Group join us in the meeting and explain uh, our gifted uh, account that we have. And uh, so that was good. It was Keith Wolf from uh, Wolf Financial Group and Randy Sabowski from the Wolf Financial Group came in as special guests uh, and uh, at the invite of Lorena Cisneros. And so that was good. I, I just have to add, Please. Mr. Ungeyer, um Ms. Shuzak was here during the inception of that fund for the Talented and Gifted program. So um, if you think of it, if you see her, make sure she knows how well that's going because she'll be quite pleased because of you know what we've how the journey we've been on with those that money we'll bring it to her thank you. thank you so certification of expenditures the finance committee met on october 18th 2021 to review financial statements for the month of september year to date and to examine various documents related to finances our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board um, I move that we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of September, total expenditures amount to $6,634,081.67, broken down between payroll, totaling $4,289,830.24, and other accounts, totaling $2,344,251.43. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Moved by Mr. Ongeyer. Second. Seconded by Ms. Thurston. Any discussion? All in favor? Nine in favor, zero against. Mr. Ongeyer. Uh, this is for certification of grants and Head Start expenditures. The Finance Committee met on October 18th, 2021 to review financial statements for grants during the month of September year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our, motion, our review concluded that there is nothing significant rep to report to the board. I move that we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of September, the total grant and Head Start expenditures amount to $634,034.16, broken down between payroll totaling $419,543.79 and other accounts totaling $214,490.37. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Moved by Mr. Ungeyer. Second. Seconded by Ms. Thurston. Any discussion? All in favor? Nine in favor, zero against. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Number 15, correspondence and communications, Ms. LeBlanc. There's nothing to report. Number 16, a dreaded executive session. We have none. Ms. Thurston, would you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the final time, motion to adjourn. And I am going to second that, by the way. All in favor? Good night. Thank you again, all.